Good evening, and welcome to Mike Jesus Langer Presents. Tonight, a set of stories about science, eggs, and impending disaster. The Inescapable Adventures of Professor Egghead is an eight-part series of standalone stories narrated by various voices of the creepypasta community back in February of 2022. It is now back as one big jumbo video for binge consumption. If you'd like to help this video travel through the rusty pipes of the YouTube algorithm, please comment egg and gently tap that like button. If you'd like to bring the visage of the egg-shaped academic into your flesh and bone world, drop by our Redbubble store for some snazzy egg shirts, and if you'd like to help keep this independent show on the road and get access to stories months in advance, drop by patreon.com slash Mike J. Langer. With that said, I'll see you guys next Friday with a brand new Egghead novella. Wishing you all a spooky night. Watching someone you love lose their mind is an indescribably painful experience. You know a person, you care enough about them to commit a good chunk of your sanity to their well-being, and then, little by little, they start to slip. What starts off as a quirk soon turns into concern. Day by day, the person you thought you knew drifts away, and all that is left is a husk reminding you of better times. More often than not, that husk is dangerous. When I was young, my father snapped. A mental breakdown. Early onset dementia. Some clinical curse. We don't know what it was, but he snapped. It took him less than a month to go from slightly paranoid to nearly burning down the house. They took him to a hospital upstate and kept him heavily sedated. Sometimes my mother and sister would go visit him, but I could never bring myself to join them. Whenever I thought about the man... I could smell gasoline. I love my son. I only get to see him every second weekend, but I love my son. I love my son, and I'm in indescribable pain. It's difficult to balance life and work in my industry. This weekend I was meant to be stuck on a 30-minute Zoom call that I was certain would stretch out to a couple of hours. My ex-wife refused to reschedule. She insisted the kid could occupy himself with his iPad. When my five-hour call with corporate was finished, I came downstairs to finally spend some quality time with my son. But Kenny was gone. All that was left of him was the iPad on the coffee table. And that's when I smell gasoline. I found him sat on the floor of the garage. His little hands were filthy with viscous brown goo. He was covered in flour, and the pack of minced beef I'd bought for dinner lay open by his side. By his feet, there was a bowl containing a strange mush of ingredients, and it smelled like gasoline. Standing there in that garage, I couldn't help but see Kenny's ancestry. Well, my son looked just like the black and white photographs of my father. I begged him for an explanation, for some inkling of reason for why he was playing with gasoline. For science. That was all he managed to say. That was all the explanation he could provide. When I scolded him for raiding the fridge and playing with things that children shouldn't play with, his apology was equally eloquent. Sorry, Daddy. We ate our delivery Chinese food in complete silence. Well, I tried to let things go, to chalk up my son's strange behavior to him being eight, rather than some arson gene that skips generations. But, well, I couldn't. After dinner, I tucked Kenny into bed and did my best to read him some Harry Potter, like I usually do when he's visiting. We're on the fourth book, The Goblet of Fire. I didn't make it past two chapters, but luckily neither did Kenny. Once he was asleep, I went down to the garage and made sure that the two jerry cans I own were on the highest shelf possible. To make up for me being busy with work on Saturday, we were meant to drive out to an amusement park on Sunday. I tried going to bed so that I'd be fresh for an early start, but there were far too many thoughts in my head to go to sleep. After tossing and turning for what felt like a decade, I made my way downstairs for a nightcap and a cigarette. As I poured myself a second drink, I noticed my son's iPad on the coffee table. The plastic cover of the tablet was filled with colourful safari animals. The cartoon creatures looked innocent and friendly. 
But in the back of my mind, I could see those lions and hippos killing. All I could think about was my father. He shared a bloodline with my kid. And the word arsonist was burning a hole in the back of my brain. But then, as I picked up the expensive piece of plastic, another thought occurred to me, a much calmer thought. Uh, perhaps my son's unsettling behavior wasn't the result of a genetic predisposition towards arson. Perhaps the kid was just copying something he saw online. The idea was like a breath of fresh air. After I filled up my glass, I grabbed the iPad and checked what my son had been watching. The results of my search were clear immediately. He'd been watching something unsettling. Right past the lock screen, I was taken to a website I didn't recognize. www.rarefilms.space The red chiller font read. The whole page was filled with pixelated clip art that seemed straight from the early 2000s, and the recommended videos tab had thumbnails of what looked like snuff films. It was somewhat discomforting to see that my wife hadn't installed any parental restrictions on the iPad. But the video my son was watching was significantly more unnerving. The Adventures of Professor Egghead in Search of Companionship. Well, the video had the quality of a bad VHS recording of a 90s sitcom. The colors were way off and the screen seemed to drift off to the side, but through the grainy image I could make out an office. A woman in a pantsuit was sitting behind a blocky computer monitor. Claire Martin, Adoption Services, read a small plaque on her table. She was typing away at her keyboard, but her attention seemed to be anywhere but on her computer screen. Her eyes kept on drifting towards the camera. The woman was terrified. No woman will have me! Came a horrid falsetto from the other room. There was a horrible smash on the door, but the woman seemed to have been expecting it. She just gently flinched. She knew what was coming. With one more deafening slam, the door came down. He lumbered into the room to a glorious applause from the studio audience. Even as the creature struggled to climb into the chair, the clapping didn't cease. The audience was going insane at the sight of this strange being. Sir, do you, do you have an appointment? The lady behind the desk said when the crowd finally quieted down. The quiver in her voice made it very clear that she was terrified of the being sitting in front of her. I am Professor Egghead, the greatest scientific mind to have ever existed. The creature screamed, bringing thunderous laughter out of the studio audience. I have no time for making appointments. I have no respect for cues! Well, he was not human, that much was clear. The creature that sat before Claire Martin's desk was not human. He was shaped like an egg, but had the face of a man. His legs impatiently dangled off the chair, and his voice was filled with boundless energy. But his eyes were bloodshot and drooping. Professor Egghead looked like the manifestation of an exhausted nightmare on methamphetamine. I'm sorry, Mr. Egghead, but you need to have an appointment to speak to me if you just... Claire's voice trailed off. The audience found this very funny. I am a professor, and I demand to be addressed as such! The egg creature screeched. I have attended as many universities... As there are grains of sand on the beach, you will address me with the honor that I have earned in the field of science. The professor swiped his stubby arm across the desk, sending the plaque and a glass of water clattering to the floor. I demand you go to the back room and bring me the most intelligent orphan you have. His brain must be as powerful as a nuclear reactor, and he must have the willpower of an ox! 
The egg creature was already shaking in the chair with neurotic energy. The woman behind the desk spoke softly as to not excite Professor Egghead further. The audience found this very funny. I'm sorry, Professor Egghead, she said. I am happy to see you right now, but the whole adoption process will take at least up to a year. You'll have to go through an evaluation and get certified before we can even... I do not have a year! I need a child right this instant! There is research to be done, and as powerful as my mind is, I cannot do it alone! I demand you bring me your brightest infant so I may raise him as my own. I'm sorry, sir. She said. I cannot help you. The egg-shaped nightmare stared at the woman for far too long. Just as I was going to skip the video forward, however, Professor Egghead started to shout again. Once again! I am left to solve my own problems. The classic scientific dilemma which no one will help me with. But I promise you this, you bureaucratic jackal. I will no longer be alone. Through my inventive personality, I will bring a lab assistant to this world. To another rapturous round of applause, the monstrosity dragged itself down to the floor and made for the exit to the office. Just as he was about to waddle through the broken doorframe, however, Professor Egghead stopped. I also promise you this, you fascist paper pusher! When the day of the final experiment comes, when all the science has run out, I will remember you, Claire Martin. I will remember you and how you attempted to halt my research. The camera focused in on the poor woman's face. Whatever cryptic threat Professor Egghead delivered had real implications for her. Claire wept. Claire wept and the studio audience found that hilarious. I watched the video as I smoked out on the front porch. By the time the lengthy crying scene came on, my cigarette was long gone. I wanted to understand what madness my son had been watching, but the strange show was starting to get the better of me. I was ready to turn off the iPad, but then the crying woman's face disappeared from the screen. Welcome to my laboratory. This is where all my scientific data is consummated. The waking nightmare was now looking straight into the camera. Let me show you how you can create your own lab assistant to aid in your scientific results. What Professor Egghead referred to as a laboratory was clearly just a hallway in some broken down Eastern European housing project. Graffiti covered the walls and the floors were creased in splotches that looked like mold. In the center of the hallway, there was a plastic bucket catching water from a leaking ceiling. The horrid Eggman stood in front of the bucket as if it were an altar. To create our artificial companion, we need ingredients of the highest purity. For the base of our being, we will need the finest of crushed wheat and mangled the flesh. He poured flour into the bucket and then topped it off with browning mints from a plastic bag. I now present to you... The creature sang as he reached into his lab coat. The humble egg! This symbol of life will force a soul into the body we are about to create... With some effort, the creature crushed the egg in his stubby fingers. A mess of eggshell and yolk dripped down into the bucket. Professor Egghead got to mixing the ingredients, all while keeping direct eye contact with the camera. Oh, the video was beyond disturbing, but I understood why Kenny had followed the crazed scientist's instructions. As bloody as those eyes were, as insane as the instructions sounded, 
There was something eerily convincing behind the Eggman's gaze. But what is life without fuel, my young scientist friends? The professor screamed once the eggshells were mixed into the pink goo. A distillate made of dead plant matter from when the planet was still young? Yes! This is the fuel that will drive the scientific mind! Make sure to preheat your oven as you sculpt your new companion into existence! For a moment, I watched the grotesque mix gasoline into the bucket, but I'd found what I was looking for. My son's playing with gasoline wasn't some form of generational curse. Kenny was simply copying what he'd seen on the iPad. I shut off the horrible video. The thought that he managed to stumble upon that weird, rare films website was discomforting, but my mind kept on drifting from parental concerns to the video itself. Something was patently wrong with the video, and it was stealing sleep away from me. That horrible egg-shaped body, those exhausted bloody eyes. As I rolled around in bed, my mind was occupied with the image of the mad professor. I didn't want to think about him. I didn't want to think about the gasoline or my father or the sanity of my son. All I wanted to do is sleep. After struggling with my thoughts for a solid hour, I reached into my bedstand and got some additional sleeping aids. Well, the pills knocked me out quickly, but they didn't clear my thoughts. I dreamt feverish dreams of science and gasoline. I was in a strange abandoned hallway. I was in my garage. I was listening to my father empty jerry cans onto the carpet in the living room. The professor screeching, the tears of the adoption woman, the stench of benzene. There was no escaping it. The disturbing footage I'd witnessed had clung to my brain and refused to relent. I kept on drifting in and out of consciousness. The fever and the pills were keeping me down, but whenever the egghead appeared in my dreams, my body reflexively dragged me back into reality. It was during one of these half-baked moments of awareness that I decided to go out for a cigarette. It felt like pulling in steam through a thick layer of wool. I could see the smoke coming out of my mouth, but any semblance of nicotine felt a thousand miles away. Everything felt distant. Even though the night was cold and I was standing outside in my boxes, I couldn't register the slightest bit of shiver in my limbs. Even my thoughts felt as if they were completely detached from me. Somewhere at my core, there was a whisper telling me to go back to bed, but it felt dull and wordless. The streetlights outside lit up the neighborhood, but the inside of my house was completely dark. I was aiming to make my way up the stairs to my bedroom, but somehow I found myself standing in the kitchen. In the pitch blackness, my perception of the world shifted to other senses. I could feel something squishing in my palms. I could hear the crunching of eggshells. I could smell... Blind and panicked, I struck the light switch. My first instinct was to scream, but... When I realized I had a lit cigarette between my lips, I gripped my teeth and quickly backed up. On my kitchen counter, there was a bowl. Inside of that bowl, there was a sculpted creature of terror. Flour, minced beef, eggs, and gasoline. In my feverish state, I'd followed the instructions of Professor Egghead to a tea. The oven beneath the counter was burning red. I was about to burn down the house. Because of the garbage that had made it onto my son's iPad, I was about to turn into a more successful version of my father. Without thinking, I grabbed the tablet and smashed it against the coffee table. Somewhere in the depths of my being, I believed that if I could destroy the iPad, I could push away what I'd seen on its screen. I slammed the tablet against the table until it was nothing but a shattered screen and a mess of wires. I would have kept going if it wasn't for the cracked iPad cover that lay on the floor. A shattered piece of plastic with a friendly hippo brought me out of my panic rage. Once the terror passed, I cleaned up both of the messes. I scrubbed through every inch of the counter and wasted untold amounts of cleaning supplies, but the whole house still smells like gasoline. All I can smell are the memories of my father and all I can hear is that horrible screeching voice. The sun is almost up. 
I don't know how I'll explain any of this to Kenny. I don't know how I can come back from all this. All I can do is give you, dear reader, some advice. Never let your children watch the adventures of Professor Egghead. After 30 minutes of listening to the man's charcoal-scented rambles, my notepad was sparse with information. Oven, gasoline, the egghead. The burnt man's frenzied babbles didn't give me much to go on in terms of how the fire actually started, but there wasn't any doubt over who was responsible for it. Jason Blumquist was rushed into the emergency care unit with third-degree burns before the blaze in his living room had even gone out. He had no prior convictions, but his father, a certain Alfred Blomquist, had spent the past two decades in a psychiatric ward up north for trying to paint his family home with gasoline. I have served in the arson department for long enough to know that the need to start fires usually singes through the family tree. Blomquist was thoroughly burnt and handcuffed to his hospital bed. His ravings didn't shed any light on the actual mechanics of the blaze, but they would serve as an easy home run for any prosecutor straight out of law school. I thanked Blomquist for his time and made my way through the sickly smelling hallways to the parking lot. Beyond the shelter of the hospital, it was storming. It was the type of downpour that could slow down, perhaps even put out a barn fire. For a couple of minutes, I stood under the plastic roof and eyed the quickest route over to my car. As I made my calculations, an old man in a bathrobe and a walker made his way out of the hospital. The old guy looked frail enough to have seen the steam engine get invented, but he dragged his walker with a sort of regal authority. He shuffled his way over to the non-smoking sign, defiantly glanced at it, and then produced a crumpled up cigarillo out of his bathrobe. I took out a cigarette and joined the old timer for some idle chatter. His cigarillo reeked with a horrible mix of vanilla and burned hospital food. When he shuffled his way back inside of the hospital, I told him I'd see him around. Not likely, he rasped, just before the door slid shut. The sprint to my car left me soaked and out of breath. Finding a steady drip of water on the case files I left on the seat didn't make me feel any better. I dug some scotch tape out of the glove box and added it to the collage of black X's on my car's roof. The rain had turned my notes into inky hieroglyphs, but the rest of the pages managed to stay intact. I had a nip, lit up another cigarette, and tried to remember what I had thought worthy of writing down. It was a sort of arson case that made an argument for a merciful god with a cruel sense of humor. Jason Blomquist, aged 35, recently divorced, has his son, Kennedy Blomquist, aged 6, over for the weekend. In the middle of the night, following in his pop's footsteps... Jason sets a fire on the ground floor. Jason manages to get himself pretty burnt up and the blaze consumes most of the living room by the time the troops contain it. But the house stays stable and the second floor is completely untouched. The upstairs bedrooms aren't even singed and what's more, little Kenny is found sleeping in his bed completely unaware of anything happening. There was an interview transcript with the kid in my morning notes. He didn't seem completely aware of what had happened. But when pressed on his father's behavior, he said his pops was angry at him the evening before the blaze. Apparently, little Kenny had watched something in his iPad that he shouldn't have, and that set his dad off. Combined with Jason Blomquist's strange ramblings in the hospital, the case seemed pretty clear. Blomquist lost his marbles and decided to set his house on fire. Now, my job is to figure out how he set his house on fire. I had another nip and thought about Blomquist's kid for a bit. Another cigarette did not make the rain slow down and water started dripping back down on my passenger seat. I emptied my ashtray out of the window and rode off to the station for the mutt. She was smart, if you're the sort of person who considers dogs capable of intelligence. Marilyn was a bright-eyed golden lab one year into her five-year service. I've been on the force for a while. She was my fourth canine. I knew not to get too attached. These dogs are destined to solve crime till their sense is dull and then they retire to become someone's fun rescue dinner fact. Only takes them a couple of years to forget their handler. She managed to get paw marks all over my notes when she got in the car, but the fact that they were barely legible calmed my nerves somewhat. 
Once Marilyn had managed to get herself comfortable, she opened her mouth and excitedly panted at the world outside. It was as if the freezing downpour beyond the windshield didn't exist for her. That mutt could retain her excitement in a meteor shower. My windshield wipers struggled on the freeway, and the inside of my car was getting unmanageably wet. Yet by the time we hit the repeating spiderweb of cul-de-sacs, the sun sheepishly peeked out from the sky. Marilyn shoved her nose through my cracked window and huffed at the outside air. She was better at getting me to the crime scene than my busted GPS. I don't like suburbia. There's no personality in those homeowner association dictated houses. You can see life flowing through the city streets. There's a character in the offbeat storefronts and the clumps of people who hang around them. People live in the city. The suburbs is just a place where people come to sleep and if the market isn't crashing to save up enough cash to escape somewhere tropical. The suburbs are also where my canines retire. When we climbed out of the car, a woman with a helmet-like haircut noticed us. She insisted on letting her snotty little child pet Marilyn. When I told her that the mutt was working and shouldn't be bothered, the helmet-headed mother grew disproportionately angry and started recording me on her phone. As me and Marilyn entered the crime scene, I could hear the crazy woman yelling something about civil service as her child wept in confusion. The troops were quick to contain the fire, but with suburban house prices this high, they usually are. The city's second finest had managed to contain the blaze halfway through the living room. A half-melted iPad with its screen smashed in delineated the exact extent of the fire. Everything beyond it, reaching out towards the kitchen, was charred history. The house had been cleared out early in the morning, but the hallway still seemed warm. Any hint of fresh rain and manicured lawns crept away and the air was replaced by the familiar stench of work. Marilyn stopped panting and lowered her snout. She breathed in the symphony of smells her ancestors were bred for, took a couple more sniffs for safety, and then sat down. She looked up at me like a hungry red light window model. Marilyn was loose for treats. They all are. If you're holding something to eat, you're any dog's best friend. If your hands are empty, you're about as interesting as the next person who walks by holding a burger. Affection doesn't come for free, and neither does arson investigation. I reached into the treat bag and pulled out a grease-smelling cookie shaped like cartoon bone. She ate a reward in one bite and immediately proceeded to work for another one. Marilyn huffed in the fumes from the black floor and dragged me down the burnt-out hallway. By the time we were in the kitchen, I didn't need an arson dog to show me where the fire started. I smelt it myself. I said, could have solved this one on my own, but I still gave her a treat. The kitchen had the obvious wear and tear of a house fire, but the oven seemed to have come out of a wholly different disaster. The metal was bent and jagged, clearly pointing towards an explosion. Blomquist had shoved something covered in accelerant into the oven and decided to cook it. Case solved. I asked, anything else of note, Marilyn? She studied my face for a moment as if we were speaking an alien language. Then her big brown eyes jumped down to the treat bag. She stared at the food like a jonesing drunk and then sniffed at the air. With a tug on the leash, she let me know that her nose might pick up another trail. Granted, of course, that I had the grub to back it up. Marilyn led me to the garage. Even before the fire, Blomquist's car must have driven circles around his property value. The ride was new and screamed of midlife crisis. Off in the corners had a bunch of workout equipment still in its boxes. Marilyn sniffed it without much enthusiasm. She wasn't interested in how Jason Blomquist was dealing with his divorce. She was interested in the dusty shelf on the far side of the garage. Most of the space was taken up by unused tools and electronics that were too useless to keep but too expensive to throw away. Yet among the forgotten items there was something bright and baby blue. A bowl. I pointed at the bowl. You want me to look at this? Marilyn's jowls grew wet. I fed her a treat that was shaped like a hydrant. The bowl was covered with what seemed to be an old tablecloth. For a second I thought that the mud had led me to Blomquist's experiment with self-rising dough, but the moment I removed the covering, I knew she found another lead. The bowl smelled like a gas station and the sticks. 
Inside of the bowl sat an egg-shaped mess of ground beef and flour. The egg hit, I thought. I disregarded most of Jason Blomquist's hospital bed ravings as actual insanity, or at least a precursor for an insanity plea. In between the sips of water that the nurse administered, Blomquist kept on rasping about having to create the egghead and doing it all for science. It all seemed like gibberish at the time, but looking down at the egg-shaped sculpture, I wished I had recorded my interview. The craftsmanship of the egg was bizarre. Its body was rough and covered in loose chunks and strands of meat. The eyes of the figure were nothing but deep thumb indentations, yet the stubby limbs of the egghead looked as if they were made out of marble. Each finger existed in its own grayish-reddish right. The bottom of the shoes were flat enough to stand on. As I examined the hunk of gasoline-soaked meat, I noticed that the teeth of the egghead were also threateningly detailed. I had a nip, and then I draped a cloth back over the baby blue bowl. The smell of accelerants was making my head throb, so I cracked open the back door to let in some air. Beyond the door was a fence, and beyond that fence there was a gravel path towards a nature trail. A gentle drizzle returned, but it was muffled under the bubbling of a nearby stream. The fresh air had cleared my head, but my lungs weren't satisfied with inhaling the smell of fresh-cut grass. I knocked a cigarette out of the pack and almost put it in my mouth before I realized where I was. I forced the smoke back into its box and elected to take the plastic bowl back to the station. While I managed to control my urges, however, the mutt did not. The wheeze escaped my lips before I had a chance to properly grip the leash. Shit! By the time my lips were pursed for the sh, Marilyn was sprinting through the backyard. She jumped the fence with the ease of a track horse and slammed her front paws on a tree. Up in the branches, with its fur slick with rain, sat a hyperventilating squirrel. Marilyn's sole purpose of existence boiled down to terrifying that tiny creature. I called. I wiggled the bag of treats. I called again. Nothing helped. The only thing that these mutts like more than food is chasing vermin. I walked out of the garage, lit up a cigarette, and made my way across the fence in as dignified a manner as I could. By the time I got to the tree, Marilyn's hunter instincts had evaporated and all that was left was shame. She kept her head low and stared up at me with a guilt that revealed the whites of her eyes. It's all right, we all have our demons to fight, I said, and then grabbed the leash. I wanted to get out of the rain and back to the station. Whatever I had witnessed in the garage would be easier to process over a cup of coffee. I tugged, but she didn't move. Marilyn was too busy sniffing the air. I tried pulling on my soaked cigarette, but came up smokeless. I stubbed out the fag in the gravel and pulled on the leash again. Come on, Marilyn, let's get you back to the station. Marilyn didn't want to go to the station. She kept her nose to the gravel. And then she pulled. I took out a treat to see whether she was serious, but Marilyn didn't bat an eye. She pulled again. She was on a trail. She led me towards the bubbling of the stream to an old wooden bridge. Walking through the nature trail, I found myself worrying that Marilyn had simply caught the scent of another squirrel, but the moment I saw the bridge, I knew she had something. Pressed into the aging wood, there were footsteps. Burnt black into the bridge, as if made by small, perfectly spherical shoes, there were footsteps. The egghead, I thought. My hand reflexively brushed up against my holster. I didn't know what to point the gun at. I just wanted to make sure it was there. I felt way in over my head. Past the bridge, the waddling footsteps disappeared into a muddy path. When the black tracks disappeared, Marilyn slowed down, but she still had a direction. As we stomped through the mud, though, her pull lessened. Whatever tracks she had been following had grown faint. Marilyn was still after something, but her steps lost their confidence. Not knowing what to make of the situation, I let the mutt drag me around while I figured out what to do. The wind had picked up and brought the rain down in gentle waves. I let the droplets wash over my tired face and tried to clear my mind by listening to the stream. At first, my thoughts kept on drifting to that chunk of sculpted meat soaked in gasoline. But with some calm breaths and a quick nip, I managed to get my head screwed on straight. I listened to the bubbling stream and Marilyn's sniffing and the falling rain and the far-off traffic and the strange hissing sound. The strange hissing sound. Like someone throwing water on a hot stove. It came from beneath the old bridge. By the time I was certain of the strange sound, Marilyn had completely lost the trail. I gave her another bone-shaped cookie for good effort. 
and then beckoned her toward the bridge. She sniffed at the air again, caught something beyond my comprehension, and took the lead herself. With each gust of rain, the hissing sound grew louder. As Marilyn dragged me off the dirt path, I started to hear something else. Beneath the strange hiss, a voice lingered and babbled in a gentle falsetto. Marilyn growled. She saw him before I did. When my eyes finally came across the egg-shaped creature, I mumbled a prayer and drew my gun. His body was of graying flesh, not unlike the egghead I found in the garage. Each droplet that hit the creature's meaty body, however, turned to steam. Wherever the rain hit, the flesh simmered up with foamy white and left a mark. The creature sat beneath the bridge, but the wind was strong enough to curve the droplets. The creature didn't seem to mind. He just babbled to himself with his sharp little teeth. He just babbled to himself and watched me. Unlike the work in progress I found in the garage, this egg had had eyes. Big red hot coals rested in the creature's sockets. The egghead's gaze sizzled as it noticed me. He stopped babbling. He stopped babbling and got up and waddled his way towards me. I dropped the leash and grabbed the gun proper and yelled at the egg to stop moving. He didn't listen. Instead, the creature raised his stubbly arms towards me. He smelled like sulfur. He smelled like sulfur, and those short, fat fingers were stretching out towards me. Like marble worms slathered in grease, the egghead's fingers slid towards me. One bark from my pistol made them retreat. I blew a hole in him. I blew a hole right down his forehead, and he fell over. An overpowering stench of rotten eggs took control of the air. The thing was oozing a yolky, greenish fluid out of its wound. One of the egghead's fiery eyes, being dislodged by my bullet, lay a stone's throw away from the corpse. When the viscous green liquid reached the hot coal, it coagulated into what looked like scrambled eggs. No, Marilyn, there's nothing good there for you. I barely got a hold of the leash to keep her from investigating. She refused any verbal orders to sit. It wasn't until I threw her a treat that I got her attention. Needing some space, I slipped the leash off and threw a handful of biscuits into the grass. Marilyn quickly occupied herself with hunting. My hands were shaking. I instinctively reached into my jacket for a nip, but I realized the possible problems with having alcohol on my breath while trying to explain this Eggman. I lit up a cigarette and picked up my phone instead. Calling the station seemed like the most reasonable thing to do. Somebody else needed to see what I was seeing. As the phone rang, I started to worry whether or not I was going to get myself sent to an asylum before telling the chief what I saw. But then, a wholly different concern occupied my thoughts. The babbling. The egghead was babbling again. Before I even reached for my gun, the terrible thing was back on his feet. Before I even managed to aim, it had me down in the mud. The egghead didn't waddle this time. He instead launched himself with shocking force straight into my solar plexus. The creature was the size of a football, but it packed a punch of artillery fire. I felt my ribs crack. My breath left my lungs like a stampede at a theater fire. The egghead straddled my chest with such weight that my panicking heart strained. The creature's right eye socket had been reduced to a circle of what looked like burnt meat and pus, but its left eye burnt with a fiery rage. The babbling had gotten louder and sterner, as if the small egghead was to teach me a lesson. His stubby fingers turned long once more. With a strange gentleness, they slithered down to my collarbone. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe and the egghead was tickling me. At first, the eggshell-covered fingers simply grazed against my neck, but soon enough, the strange sensation turned painful. The thin fingers were growing increasingly hot. I could smell my stumble being singed. With my lungs compressed and hot irons at my vocal cords, I couldn't manage anything but a yelp. A yelp, luckily, was all the girl needed. With a growl I'd never heard before, Marilyn knocked the egghead off of my chest. She barked at the tumbling creature with the intensity of a shotgun and then leapt at it once more. Marilyn's second contact with the creature, however, was met with a sharp whimper. She sunk her teeth into the creature, but immediately let go. A puff of smoke came out of the dog's mouth, and the oval creature went crashing into the stream. The egghead met the water with a sputter of a sauna rock. The water was starting to turn muddy with the rain, but I could see the creature clearly. Its flesh had turned the pale white of an eggshell, and the coal eyes sprung bubbles like a hangover tablet. But the thing was still alive. I stomped at the monster. I stomped at the egghead until all that was left were coagulating clumps of greenish goop flowing down the stream. I made sure the egghead had been taken care of and then climbed out of the water to check up on the dog. 
she wasn't doing well. I didn't leave anything out of the report. The manila envelope I dropped at the chief's desk had the look of an overzealous sandwich. I described the egghead in detail. I included sketches and theories and even some photographs of what remained of the terror before the spring carried it away. It didn't do any help. The rest of the station was reluctant to believe what I had to say, but I was given some leeway to focus on the Blomquist fire investigation. A second interview with the burnt man didn't reveal anything new. All Jason Blomquist did was nonsensically blabber about the egghead again and speak about the importance of science. After a train ride up north, I managed to flag down Blomquist's ex-wife for a coffee. But that conversation was fruitless as well. Aside from the couple mentions of his father's internment, Jason Blomquist never spoke about arson, let alone showed any tendency towards it. I wanted to sit down with the kid, Kenny, to see if he could shed any light on the fire, but his mother refused to let me interview him. I could have nudged someone at the station to make the interview mandatory, but I didn't. Forcing the kid to talk to me wouldn't make the nightmares of the egg-shaped creature disappear. It wouldn't bring Marilyn's sense of smell back. For a while, I fought the idea, but eventually I let all thoughts of the egghead die in that muddy stream of cracked shell. She had burnt her front gums and would have to be careful about solid food for the rest of her life, but it was her nose that was given a death sentence. Marilyn's sense of smell would never come back. The vet figured that out within a couple of minutes of the visit. In an effort to save me from the insane creature, the mud had rendered herself unemployed. I couldn't adopt her. Arson dogs don't belong into crammed city apartments. What I did manage to do was pull some strings and shoot down some adoption requests. After calling in a few favors with the pen pushers, Marilyn managed to get herself adopted by my nephew out east. I have to drive half the country to get to her, but after the winter holidays... Once all the fireworks have been set off and it's too cold for forest fires, I see her. I see her and she remembers me. Like a rubber band stretched pale threatening to step in half to the slightest breeze of wind. That's how I felt for as long as I can remember. At times, the mental tension shuffled around in the background of my inner monologue. At times, it took center stage with undeniable force. But for as long as I can remember, I... I always felt like I'm a couple of pushes away from a nervous breakdown. There wasn't anything specific that I was worried about. I mean, yeah, sure, I, I could find things to explain away the stress. My social life, big milestones, whatever was on the news that day. But there was never any resolution. There was never any connection. Whatever I was terrified of rested so deep in my self-conscious abyss that it was impervious to rationalization. When I was younger, I bridged the gap between who I felt like and who I wanted to be with liquor. I'd grab my first drink at a house party or at a bar or a club or my living room and, and that feeling of impending doom would leave me. For a while, at least. Then I, I'd wake up on a couch or in someone's bed or a bus or my living room floor and the and the certainty of an incoming apocalypse would be back tenfold. Something, something horribly vague, but something was going to go wrong. Something bad was happening, and I wasn't prepared. A couple of years after university, when it stopped being fashionable to be drunk on a weekday, my alcoholic coping mechanisms mutated into a twisted need for affection. I was a mess. I knew that. Drinking to suppress that knowledge was no longer sustainable. Yet undeniable knowledge is easily diluted in a crowd of differing opinions. I found that if, if I could trick someone into believing that I'm normal, if I could morph my mannerisms to be calm and relaxed, I would start to believe the lie myself. 
if they fell in love with me, that passing thought would harden into absolute certainty. Pure bliss. A strained rubber band gone limp. Yet no high, even those produced by the endocrine glands, last forever. After a week or two, something would always start to feel off. Something was wrong. That period of bliss shortened each time I reached for it again. The well of calm in strangers' laps was running low. Eventually it went dry. I've tried talking to a priest. I've done charity work. I've backpacked through India. I drank ayahuasca and experimented with loads of other drugs. Nothing has helped. The past 32 years of my life has existed under a strain of a vague sense of distress. I've managed to survive in the shadow of that unspeakable uneasiness, but it hasn't been pleasant. This year, I decided I would do something about it. I spent the first couple of weeks of January doing online self-help questionnaires and most of February doing therapy over Zoom. No amount of examination made that feeling dissipate. No amount of self-reflection could obscure that ever-present darkness. I walked away from my online counselor with some breathing exercises, a recommendation for melatonin tablets and a discount voucher if I ever wanted to come back. It's March now, still not willing to give up. I get off at Prague's main railway station and descend underground to the metro. The carriage smells like burnt rubber and it's far too crowded and a group of teenagers get into a fist fight within spitting distance of me. It's not a pleasant ride. But then again, me and the underground have never gotten along. The darkness of the tunnels, the tight squeeze beneath the mother of all city, the speed, it's not a place for someone who's not at peace. By the time we reach the edge of the city, the carriage is nearly empty. The dread doesn't pass with the crowds. The dread stays exactly where it's always been. Outside of the subway, rain beats down on the world like it's trying to cleanse it. I find refuge in a nearby pub and get myself a beer. It tastes good, and a part of me wants more of it, but my stomach protests. I'm... I'm far too nervous to drink. I'm far too nervous to do anything. For a while, I keep the glass company and watch the waves of rain wash over the cement panel housing. I find myself wondering whether I'm trying to wait out the weather or if I'm trying to avoid the final leg of my journey. The skies look apocalyptic and show no signs of improving. I take one final sip of beer, put my jacket over my head and face down the elements. Drunken with age, they greet me at the door. It's only been a couple of Christmases, but time seems to have passed much faster in my childhood home. My mum has trouble walking, but she shoes me out of the kitchen when I try to help her with coffee. They both seem happy to see me. For a while we talked about nothing in particular. My mother catches me up on where all my cousins ended up, and my father shares some of his recent political opinions with me. I go through the motions of talking about work and life and why I'm not having children yet and then when the conversation starts to drag and my father is about to turn on the television I I ask whether I've always been broken I try to explain myself but words have always escaped me when I try to speak of the dread I ask if I've always been nervous whether there wasn't a time that I was constantly worried. My mother suggests that maybe it's the barometer pressure from the storm. Maybe that's why I'm not doing well at this particular moment. I tell her it's not the case of the weather. I tell her I don't know where the feeling came from, but that I felt it for as long as I can remember. My father says I was still normal at his brother's wedding when I was eight. His use of the word normal gets a glare from my mother but I've lived under the same roof with them for 20 years. She concedes. My condition is not normal. She hobbles over to my old bedroom while saying something about a tape of the wedding. I follow her to the threshold of the room and then I stop. The place where I used to sleep. 
It looks like a memorial for a child that died young. All of the posters that I put up in my final years under my parents' roof have been torn down and replaced with a never-ending collection of crayon drawings. Most of them are of Pokemon concepts straight from the mind of an unoriginal child. But there's a particular drawing of an angry-looking egg creature that tugs at my attention. She opens up the closet. The top shelf is filled with clothes that I can never wear again. The rest of the space is taken up by slabs of black plastic in thin cardboard sleeves. My mother's shaking fingers run across a collection of VHS tapes, as if she was a librarian searching for an ancient tome. I try to make sense of the crude drawing of the egg creature above my bed, yet before I do, she ushers me out of the room. Not a single electronic device has ever been unplugged from my parents' television. In a wobbling tower of plastic and dust, a collection of DVD players and dormant internet modems rest. She plugs in the tape into the VCR without a hint of hesitation. We watch the recording of the wedding. My father makes off-color jokes about his brother and the eventful divorce. My mother comments on weight and dresses of those in attendance, and she is the first one to spot the child when it appears on the dance floor. A miniature boy in a miniature suit twisting his body offbeat to a Spice Girls song. The kid was smiling and having a blast. He looked nothing like me, but I knew somewhere out there in the murky realm of the fourth dimension, there was a singular thread of time that connected the two of us into one. The dancing child eases the mood of the room, but once the tape ends, once the television is turned off, once that brief respite from the sense of doom leaves me, I ask questions about my childhood. No obvious traumatic events present themselves. I ask about the specific members of the family, whether they could have done something to me. The thought of my disposition being a product of abuse was always purely hypothetical to me. I never had any proper suspicions, I just, I just wanted to make sure. I just wanted to make sure, but each name I ask carries within it an implied accusation. Doubt fills the room and makes the air unbreathable. I stop asking questions. They sit in silence. My mother mentions a segment of the news she saw about horse therapy at the Messiaric Psychiatric Institute. Apparently it's really helpful for people who are stressed out. She so asks if I wanted her to call them and check if there are any available spots. As I tell her I'm old enough to make my own appointments, my father switches on the television. We don't dwell into my feelings of doom. Instead, we watch a spaghetti western. None of those horses look comfortable. My mother shuffles off to bed, and eventually so do I. My father stays up and watches an Austrian show about a crime-solving dog. When the television goes quiet, I am still awake. Surrounded by drawings made by six-year-old me, I feel desperately old. I feel like I'm running out of time. I feel like something bad will happen soon and I will be responsible for it. The scribble of the egg creature scowls at me from the wall, but I refuse to meet its gaze. Instead, I look at the poorly drawn Pokemon and try to remember a single episode of the Saturday morning cartoon. In my adult state, the hours upon hours of Pokemon I consumed as a child feel like a fever dream. The only thing I distinctly remember is that our television caught an Austrian channel that played the episodes in German three weeks in advance. I would tape those episodes, study them, learn the basic plot points, and then, when Saturday morning rolled around, I would call up my cousin and tell him the entire plot before it happened. Maybe... Maybe it was a joke and I just wanted to irritate him. Maybe I needed him to know that I was able to see things ahead of time. That part of my life sits beneath a thick fog that I cannot cut through. My breathing speeds up again and I realize I can no longer stay still. I sit up. The egg creature stares at me from the wall. I start feeling dizzy. Each breath 
seems to be drawing at a finite pull of strength in my chest. I stand up. The air creature's foot is defiantly raised, prepared for a stomp. Its limbs are stubby, but they are disquietingly muscular. I can't breathe. I look into the egg creature's manic eyes, and I can't breathe. As if my life depended on it, I leap at my wall and I tear down the horrible drawing. I almost rip it apart, but then I remember I, I don't live in this room anymore. The storm outside has long passed. All I can hear is the dripping of grain gutters and my parents snoring from the other room. I resist the urge for destruction and fold up the drawing. I place it in the wardrobe, right by the VHS tapes. My breath returns, but the panic doesn't subside. My chest tightens, and my head immediately starts rattling off heart attack symptoms. Two weeks ago, a doctor told me I was perfectly fine. I remind myself this wouldn't be the first false alarm. Something still feels bad. I've got to grab a glass of water to calm my nerves. But on my way, I see a sight that agitates them once more. My father left the door open on his way to the bedroom. My parents have stopped snoring. Sprawled out on their backs, they look like undignified corpses. I linger in the doorway, clutching both my breath in the glass of water until my father scratches his face. Wanting to avoid the visage of dead parents in my dreams, I don't go to sleep. Instead, I turn on my bedside lamp and go through my closet of tapes. A couple of the tapes carried my mother's neat handwriting in green pen. John's Wedding, 96, October. Trip to Thailand, 01. June, Joseph's 80th, 03, April. Most of the tapes, however, were labelled in crayon by a hand incapable of fine motor control. Pokemon 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus. Pokemon 1, 2 and 3. Pokemon Squirtle. Pikmunk 1. The undecipherable organization of the tapes provided some respite. For a moment, I tried to put myself in that kid's shoes, to remember what it's like to feel the need to hoard episodes of cartoons. For a moment, I find myself reconnecting with that little boy. A smile crossed my lips. It didn't last long. Bad warning. Sweat starts to gather around my hairline. My teeth clinch without my input. Scratched out in the red crayon, the title of the tape faces me down. Bad warning. The black plastic of the VHS tape seems darker than that of the rest. Something feels patently wrong with the tape. A sudden burst of fear rushes through my veins. I almost slam the door of the closet. But I stop myself. I am terrified of the tape, but the fear is tangible. I am scared of the tape because it's about the bad thing. The sense of vague doom that has followed me for so long, it's been distilled and melted down into a single brick of black plastic. Holding it makes me feel ill. I want to smash it on the ground and throw its wreckage out of the window. But I don't. I know I'm far too close to finding out what's wrong with me. I know I'm far too close to finding out what's wrong with me to turn back. Bad warning. I slide the tape into the dusty tower of Babel and watch the television. A hallway of a decrepit building flickers on the screen. In the center of the frame floats a dirty pillowcase with black marbles for eyes and a drawn-on crooked grin. 
Hey there, children. The effigy has limbs of thick yellow rope, and even though no puppeteer or a string are visible, it shakes wildly with every word. My name is Professor Egghead, and I'm here to teach you how to be safe. The camera is ripped out of the tripod with a loud fumble and starts to move across the abandoned hallway. The pillowcase follows, dragging its stringed feet through broken glass and rubble. The first lesson we will learn today is about cars. The puppet comes to a swaying stop at a piece of graffiti. On the crumbling wall, as if scratched out by a desperate cave dweller, sits a picture of a car. When crossing the street, make sure to look both ways. Otherwise, something bad might happen. It's a dangerous world out there, children. And if we're not vigilant, then we might die. The creature shivers, and its scribbled mouth crumples into a long, drawn-out wheeze. It takes me a moment to notice that the creature is dragging its feet across the hallway again. I'm far too focused on its eyes. Like fickle drops of mercury, the puppet's eyes shiver. The black of the marble thins down into a bloodshot red. A misshapen iris festers up in the center of each eye. With a tear, the pillowcase splits apart to reveal sharp, needle-like teeth. The second lesson we will learn today is about trust. Never trust a stranger. Never. On the wall, there is a carved out picture of a man in a trench coat. The string of the puppet's arm lifts up to point to it. The arm is no longer yellow. It is the color of sickly skin. Never trust anyone! The creature screamed, baring its razor teeth. If you trust a stranger, they might murder you. They might torture you. Or they might be a sexual lord and want to do bad things to you. Never trust anyone. Do not trust strangers. Do not trust the police. Do not trust your parents. Only trust me, Professor Egghead. Like plump snail's eyes, the puppet's limbs start to react into its body. The pillowcase starts to morph as well, bloating up as if it was a filthy balloon made of cloth. Soon enough, any memory of the strange puppet is stifled beneath a demented metamorphosis. Staring at me from the television is a lifelike rendition of the manic egg creature folded up in my closet. I am Professor Egghead, commander of knowledge, dominator of wisdom. If you do not listen to my final safety lesson, children, you will suffer for all eternity, in indescribable pain! The puppet finishes his transformation into a creature of flesh and spit and spite. With a swift kick, Professor Egghead knocks down a weathered wooden door. The camera refuses to enter the wooden door. This visibly frustrates the egg creature. How are the children to learn their lesson if they do not witness the horror? How am I supposed to keep the children safe if their eyes do not gaze upon the filth? With sharp stomps punctuating the creature's screams, the cameraman is convinced. With a visible shake, the camera moves past the door frame and focuses on the egghead. Our final lesson today is going to be something you'll have to remember for a long time. It's going to be something you'll have to repeat to yourself over and over as you go to sleep. It's the most important lesson you will ever learn. Without warning, the egghead seizes the camera and pries it away. 
His fat fingers rest on the edge of the frames. His hot breath fogs up the lens. Yet his bloodshot eyes transgress the camera and stares deep into my soul. You're in danger, children. And so is everyone else around you. Everyone is going to suffer. Everyone is going to suffer. And only I can help. Only Professor Egghead can keep you safe. When the time comes, I will hold you like a friend. But until then... The Egghead runs his thumb across the lens, clearing the fog. His mouth drips spit, and his hands shake as he gets a better handle on the camera. Until then, you must see the danger. You must witness the creature that will destroy us all. You must understand what you must fear. The camera shifts over to the corner of the room. I see it. I see that horrible thing. That unearthly pile of flesh and blood and bone. The thing stirs and shifts as if it was aware it is being watched. Within its long bloody tendrils, there is a heart. That heart shines in a sickly yellow glow with each sluggish beat. It will grow! It will grow! It will consume all! Know it! Remember it! Fear it! Fear it and pray that when the day finally comes, I will be there to save you! Fear it and hope that... I shut off the television. I shut off the television and lay down on the floor. My chest heaves in terror. The tangled eldritch mass is no longer on the screen, but I can still see it. Strands of coiled beating flesh consume my mind entirely and make me heave. I turn over to my stomach and crawl on all fours to the bathroom through the darkness. I puke out the glass of water in any semblance of the concept of time. There is barely enough space in front of the toilet for me to curl up, but I do. Surrounded by walls, I hold myself and shake and pray that the afterburn of that horrid nightmare will leave me soon. It doesn't. The terror refuses to let go of my heart, but as the cold sweat on my face becomes frigid, the fear is overtaken by a horrid exhaustion. I barely manage to climb up to my knees. Crawling into my childhood bed feels like entering a casket. Beneath the fog of approaching sleep, I can still see it. I can still see that horrible, squirming nightmare. You should be scared. I shut my eyes as hard as I can. I try to pretend I can't feel the mattress shifting by my feet. Feel the fear. Understand its source. Surrender to it. The stench of phosphorus snakes its way into my nostril. The bed shifts again. A heavy burden moves across my chest in crude, shuffling steps. Surrender to the fear and pray to the gods of science that the professor will be here. To rescue you when the day of judgment comes. He stands above me. He's unavoidable. He stares into my eyes. Do not attempt to ignore me, child. I am your savior. I am Professor Egghead, the scientific mind which keeps humanity from the brink of disaster. I will get the respect I demand. No one can deny the company of Professor Egghead! He stomps. My eyes can no longer stay closed. The moment I meet his mad burning gaze, I scream. I scream loud enough to wake my parents and have them rush into the room. They stand above my bed, shrunken with age, trying to comprehend what happened to their son. I lack the words to express myself. I simply weep. I weep, and from across the room, Professor Egghead watches me with an excited grin. They're old, and they're tired, and they're scared. 
I tell them to go to sleep. I tell them I'm fine. I tell them I'm fine. And then, under Professor Egghead's watchful eye, I look up the website for the Missyaric Psychiatric Institute. The rubber band has snapped. I have a tendency of stumbling into places where I don't belong. I can't help it. I'm just a curious fella. When I was in my teens, my curiosity manifested itself through trips to abandoned factories and shortcuts through finely manicured lawns. After a broken leg and a couple of trips in a squad car, my curiosity was tempered, but I would still get my kicks by squeezing myself into social events I wasn't invited to. I thought that sneaking into rap parties and the occasional housewarming would be a significantly safer alternative to urban exploration. I was wrong. It was a bit after ten and there was a light drizzle in the air. Originally I was meant to be grabbing a couple of drinks with a friend I haven't seen for a long time, but through stifled yawns and complaints about not getting enough sleep in med school, they brought the night to a premature close. The night was still young and I was still too sober. I roamed the streets and searched for trouble I could get myself into. A group of freshers, maybe a year or two younger than me, stood outside of an apartment and spoke in drunken whispers that weren't meant to attract the attention of the neighbors. Some of them smoked like regular addicts. Some puffed on their cigarettes as if they were cigars. But they all smoked. I asked for a light and soon enough was chatting with the tipsy crowd. The night was going fantastic. The drinks were strong and the music was groovy. The only real issue was that there was no balcony at the apartment, so all the smokers had to go down five flights of stairs whenever they were to satisfy their craving. I told them about the time my friend and I snuck into an abandoned munitions factory and about how we had to climb up to the roof to feel safe lighting up. A very drunk member of the group who was severely underdressed for the weather kept on asking me if I wasn't scared, sneaking around an old building. I offered her my jacket and said the only thing I was scared of was lighting up a smoke around the smell of gunpowder. The real smokers had another cigarette, and those just trying it out shivered. When the group headed back inside of the apartment, I followed. By the sounds of it, all of them had met just a week or two prior but I still got the gentlest of highs sneaking myself into their midst. The underdressed girl fumbled off my jacket and asked me if I was also a part of the film and television society. Obviously, I was, I said. Why else would I be at this party? A mountain of shoes that reeked of sweat sat right in front of the door, but once we threw our coats on the coat pile, the scent of the party became distinctly liquor-based. I made my way to the closest gathering of drinks and poured myself a poor man's tequila sunrise. The whole gathering had the unmistakable ambiance of a fresher's party. Deafeningly loud in general, but quiet in corners. For a while I drank and floated around the different conversation circles, listening to people passionately recommend foreign TV series. The conversation wasn't particularly fascinating, but the rain had picked up outside, and it was nice to be around people. At some point, a neighbor frantically buzzed on the door and insisted that it was late, and that the music should be turned down. Within three songs, someone had grown enamored enough with the tunes to blast them back to full volume. I had taken two vodka shots with a red-faced boy who looked straight out of high school. I found myself dancing along with the music, it wasn't particularly good, but the alcohol was catching up with me. I poured myself another tequila and juice, and made my way towards the kitchen to see if there was anything else floating around the party. The moment my feet touched tile, I stopped dancing. 
The atmosphere in the kitchen was radically different from the rest of the house party. No drug stuff was happening. No one was milling around the water tap or fridge. Instead, two middle-aged men and an elderly woman sat at the table. All three of them were oval in terms of body shape and wore what looked like lab coats over their large bodies. Their skin was unhealthy to the point of grayness, and their eyes were a pinkish yellow. Exhaustion and something more nefarious seemed to have completely drained them of life. But the old woman managed a faint smile when I entered the kitchen. Excited for the tape? She croaked in my general direction. Yes, I said, turning away from the trio. Very excited. I gathered my thoughts, refilled my drink, and slunk to the part of the party that didn't make me uncomfortable. There was a couple more buzzes at the door, but the volume of the music didn't change. Moving through the clumps of conversation, I managed to find out that the gathering was held for the premiere of some... tape. Apparently, the strange grouping in the kitchen were the first to arrive at the party. No one had proper details. Most folks just came along because of the free booze. Drunkenly, though, people were getting excited about this mysterious tape. I must admit that I too found myself somewhat excited to see what this tape was. I found myself getting drunk, too. I was enjoying the anticipation. Then, I bumped into a locked door. I had drank enough to get lost on my way to the bathroom. I found the line shortly after, but the thought had struck me. I was drunk at a party full of drunk strangers, and there was a locked door. While I waited to use the bathroom, I kept on thumbing the two bent paper clips in my pocket. After I finally managed to empty my bladder, I went back to the door. No one was watching, and it didn't take long. I picked the lock and went into the place where I wasn't meant to be. The moment the door closed behind me, the party simmered down into nothing but the throbbing bass of the music. I stood in a large bedroom with a couch and an old television in the center of the room. The air smelled like fresh sheets. Outside, the rain had turned violent. Right by the window, a fire escape shimmered and creaked beneath the wind of the storm. Just to prove to myself how comfortable I was, I stretched my legs on the couch, then strolled around to the bed and explored how soft it is. There was an iPhone on the dresser. Out of pure instinct, I snagged it. For a moment, I questioned the impulse, but then I just made sure the phone was off and looked around the room for other valuables. I found nothing of worth in the bedside drawers, and I was going to move on to the desk. But then I heard the door open. I slid under the bed like my life depended on it. Immediately to calm my heartbeat, I started comparing my current predicament to almost getting caught in an old Soviet munitions factory. The heavy footfalls I heard were scarier than any post-Soviet security guard. Soon. Soon so very soon. Gurgled one of the men from the kitchen. We will see it all so very soon. Patience, friend. Rasped the other. If science has taught us anything, it is patience. The two heavy men walked by the bed, and the scent of popcorn followed. My brain struggled against the layer of dust at my nose. I did my best to focus on the smell of food. The door to the party opened, letting in a torrent of music. Are the snacks prepared? The shrill woman asked. Yes. One of the gray men replied. It is almost time. The door closed. The steady heartbeat of bass went on for a couple more pumps, but then went quiet. The old woman was directing the group towards the bedroom with high-pitched screams. 
fully aware of the two strange men a couple of feet away from me. I rolled to my side to avoid sneezing. Through the mirror I could see the television and one of the oval men. His arms were disproportionately stubby to his body, and his fingers squirmed with excitement. I can't wait. He gurgled at his partner. You will. He gurgled back. Then, the door opened and the room started to fill with drunk teenagers. Occasionally, someone would yell about how excited they were to see the tape, but the old woman quickly shushed them. I was still stuck beneath the bed, but the anticipation was getting to me. We were all drunk and young, and a rowdy madness simmered in that room. The crowd amplified the legend of the tape, and the booze gave it edge. By the time the old lady waddled in front of the television, even though there must have been at least 30 of us in the room, everyone went silent. Thank you for coming to this meeting of the Film and Television Society. It is now time for the tape. The old woman's words provoked a drunken whisper that spread throughout the room. She shushed it with the authority of a school teacher. You are not to speak during the playing of the tape. If you do, however, feel like laughing, this is permitted. This tape is meant to amuse and delight and educate. Now, with no further comments, I present to you Professor Egghead's Education Station. A university lecture hall flickered onto the screen. The hall had the audience of a non-mandatory class, and from the few students that were there, most of them looked asleep. A couple, however, had their laptops open and were furiously typing notes. I, uh, I seem to have lost my words. The lecturer was a short man with a scruffy goatee. Sweat was gathered on top of his bald head, and his eyes darted back and forth between the unenthused crowd. I know I was meant to say something, but just give me a moment. Just let me find my place. He spoke in a near whisper, but the microphone attached to his collar boomed his mumblings with an echo. Magnified above him loomed a PowerPoint presentation. The nervous lecturer cycled through the slides, looking for something. Back in the audience seats, the napping students started to wake up. The moment their eyes opened, they would grab their laptops and start furiously typing notes. No one in the lecture hall looked comfortable. Ah, oh, yes, the cat. The lecturer breathed out a sigh of relief that hissed in the speakers above. A slide titled, The Copenhagen Interpretation, was projected onto the wall. Beneath the title, there was a picture of a film reel with a cat. The first three frames featured a simple picture of the cat, but then the reel split into two sources. The cat was alive in the first, and dead in the second one. Okay, so we have the cat outside of the box. Uh, no, wait. The cat is inside of the box, but the box is... I don't think I can do this. The students continued furiously typing their notes. Beneath the clattering of the keyboards and the lecturer's labored breathing, another sound arose. The applause of a studio audience. I can't. Uh, please, I, uh, I can't do this anymore. The lecturer pleaded with the students. Please, if we all work together. His words fell on deaf ears. The students kept on typing their notes and the applause kept on getting louder. The bald man looked up to the PowerPoint presentation and wept. The cat is in the box. The cat is not in the box. The box is... I can't. I can't do this anymore. I give up. The doors flew open, and a nightmare leapt into the lecture hall. I am Professor Egghead. 
the emperor of all universities, the headmaster of all knowledge. I am Professor Egghead, and this man is an imposter. This Professor Egghead looked much like the gray-skinned strangers I met in the kitchen, but where their bodies were misshapen with weight, his was completely inhuman. He was shaped like an egg, an egg with a horribly tired face, with diseased eyes and sharp teeth. A lab coat stretched across his malproportioned body, and he gripped a large, colorful mallet in his stubby fingers. Please, I beg you. I don't want this anymore. I have a family. The lecturer begged. Just let me go. Let all of us go. We have done this for long it The egghead's mallet looked like something out of a cartoon, but it met the lecturer's forehead with the bluntness of a snuff film. Within three savage hits, the lecturer no longer had a face. The studio audience found this show of brutality to be absolutely hilarious. The students in the lecture hall were terrified. They stopped typing. The lecture hall had stared on in horror as the egg-shaped nightmare continued to assault the teacher. I have unthroned this false prophet! The egghead screamed victoriously, sending thick chunks of spittle across the room. Look at me! I am the teacher now! The students on the television started to type again. The drunk freshers in the bedroom began to grow uneasy. For a moment, my view of the television screen was obstructed by figures moving in the darkness of the mirror. A couple of the drunk teenagers had seen enough of the tape and wanted out. The moment they started to move, a series of boos came from the studio audience. You there! Sit. Back. Down. The egghead screamed from the television. The drunk freshers trying to move through the room stopped. Yes! You there in the darkness, go back to where you were. I am the academic equivalent of a baron. You will not disrespect me during my own lecture. Sit down. A deafening round of applause came from the television. The figures in the darkness sat back down where they were. I once again had full view of the television. A pair of bloodshot eyes stared back into the camera, but something felt off. It felt like the egghead was looking specifically at me. As if out of instinct, my eyes drifted to the dusty floor. Good! The creature's voice softened. Now that everyone is seated and taking notes, it is time to introduce you to the field of which I hold dominion over. Science. There have been lies printed in the press about my kingdom. Propaganda by enemies both foreign and domestic meant to instill a false sense of security. Being a scientist is not cool. Being a scientist is not fun. Being a scientist is not rewarding. To submit your body to science is to stare into the unknown and surrender all hope. The studio audience praised Professor Egghead's monologue with a round of applause. The person sitting on the top of the bed that I was hiding under shifted uncomfortably. I found myself watching the television once more. There was something horribly wrong with the egghead creature, and I kept wanting to look away, but I'm a curious fella. I couldn't help myself. Professor Egghead had taken over the PowerPoint presentation. The title of the slide was Lies About Science, 
and featured pictures of smiling scientists and lab technicians. Professor Egghead stared at the cheery pictures as if they were an affront to God. He spat on the wall, leaving behind a sliding splatter of milky brown. Do not believe the media. Science is suffering. Science is pain. To illustrate my point, I will present a picture we cannot comprehend. Ceremonially, the egg had extended the PowerPoint controller and pressed his stubby finger on the next slide button. The whole room of freshers erupted in screams. I averted my eyes as soon as I could, but even the mere glimpse of what was on the screen made me stifle a cry of my own. I stared at the floor and tried to clear my mind, yet the afterimage remained. A mess of inhuman eyes and strands of flesh and arteries. The rest of the room continued screaming. The freshers were trying to escape, but something was in their way. Yes! Yes! This is the sound of science! The egghead screamed from the television. This is the music of research! We do not know what it is! We fear it! We should fear it! Science is not cool! A banging broom from below joined the screaming of the freshers. The bedroom door remained closed. I dug myself further beneath the bed to avoid a stampede. I kept my eyes to the floor to avoid going insane. Now you understand! Now you are one with science! It is time! It is time for the induction into the final university! The studio audience cheered from the television. The screams of the freshers grew and grew. All I could smell was gunpowder. Someone was standing on the top of the bed yelling at people to break the window. The girl who I lent my jacket to had fallen on the floor not far from me. Beneath the stampede, she couldn't get out. The world existed in complete, deafening chaos. And then, it stopped. Everything had suddenly gone silent. All I could hear was the gentle static buzz from the television. The jacket girl was gone. Everyone was gone. Outside, the fire escape gently creaked in the wind. I tried to keep my eyes glued to the floor. I tried waiting all of it out, but eventually I couldn't help but satisfy my curiosity. I looked toward the mirror and stifled another scream. The lecture hall on the television was now full. Among the note-taking students sat drunk and underdressed and terrified freshers. The camera focused on their scared faces. The studio audience reacted with joyous laughter. Among the hall of scared youth, the gray skins from the kitchen sat. They were all beaming with unbridled joy. Is there anyone missing in attendance? Professor Egghead screamed. No one is hiding from their research duties, are they? The moment the egghead looked into the camera, I forced my face back to the floor. Hello? Is someone missing? The egghead said softly. Ah, well. If someone is missing, they will be found eventually. They are always found. In the world of research, there are only entryways. There are no exits. No one can escape the company of Professor Egghead. The studio audience rewarded this with another round of applause. But the clapping eventually died down. By the time I looked back at the television, the screen had gone dark. I stared at it for a minute or two and tried to make sense of what had just happened. But no explanation presented itself. Once I was sure the room was empty, I crawled out of my hiding spot and immediately went for the television. I turned it off. I also unplugged all the cables for good measure. The whole apartment was empty. All that was left of the visitors was a sea of sweaty shoes and a couple of coats. 
I tried convincing myself that there was no conceivable way a television could suck in a room full of people, but my mind refused to be rational. I took a quick gulp of some tequila, and it calmed me somewhat. But I knew what I really had to do was go home. I fished my coat out of the pile, dug out my shoes, and was ready to leave. Just as I was about to open the door, however, there was a loud knock. Police, open up. I backed off from the door. Very quickly, my mind went through the possible outcomes of a situation. There was no reasonable explanation for my attendance of the party, and there definitely wasn't any reasonable explanation for what had happened at said party. With the amount of alcohol in my bloodstream, I knew I couldn't talk my way past the cops. I didn't trust myself not to slur my words, but I still had some faith in my sense of balance. Leaving behind a gruff-voiced officer banging on the door, I made my way back to the bedroom and opened the window. My landing from the fire escape wasn't very graceful, and I sprained my ankle running back home. But I made it out. I don't understand what happened to all of those freshers. I can't comprehend what this egghead creature wants. But I managed to make it out of that apartment alive. I made it out alive. Yet as the hours pass, I'm starting to realize that I didn't make it out unscathed. I feel ill. With every passing minute, I feel less and less comfortable in my skin. It's as if I'm not alone. It's as if the egghead had somehow clung onto my mind past the fire escape from the party. When I close my eyes, I can hear him. I can hear him with undeniable clarity. No one can escape the company of Professor Egghead. I have a tendency of stumbling into places I don't belong. But after tonight, I think I've learned my lesson. If you ever get invited for the viewing of some mysterious tape, stay as far away as you can. Stay as far away as you can, because once Professor Egghead notices you, there is no escape. After some nasty business last year, my boss established a no stolen shit policy, and that provided a lovely hole in the market. People would come in with something sketchy, I'd tell them no. They'd make a fuss, I'd tell them no again. And then I would lowball them, discreetly, out of my own pocket. No negotiation. Quick handover. Goods go under the counter, and the slideshow that is the security camera is none the wiser. I tell my friends my inventory, they tell their friends my inventory, Clean house by the end of the week. Nice little ecosystem of discount goods and sticky fingers. No prying eyes, no complaints. That is, until today. So there's this guy, a kid really, a couple of steps out of high school who comes in on the regular, doesn't seem like a junkie and doesn't seem particularly broke, brings in phones and laptops that look just about new. I lowball this kid, like really lowball him, and he never bats an eye. Figured he's just some college boy who gets a kick out of stealing his friend's shit. The money, for him, was just the cherry on top of an adrenaline rush Sunday. I didn't have to invest too much to turn a profit with him. He's probably lifting this shit off his classmates, so I figure it's a limited time offer. No one heists from the same spot forever, so I go all in. It's good money. I buy the stuff for a penny from the kid. My cousin cracks and clears whatever comes through overnight and someone buys the merch by the next afternoon. I was pretty sure the guy was going to get caught eventually, but I didn't expect it to happen the way it happened. He stumbles in last morning, reeking of booze and sweat, kids huffing like an emphysema case, and his skin is the color of drywall, but he's still patient. He puts an iPhone on my counter. No cover. Brand new. I point to the stolen goods sign for the benefit of the camera, and then we make the swap. Kid looks like he's about to pass out. I ask him if he's alright, he says yes, takes his cigarette money, and shuffles out into the daylight. I work in a pawn shop, I meet all sorts, usually bad sorts, on a regular basis. I decide the kid is none of my business and get back to work. 
The phone, as advertised, is factory new. I still figure I'll chuck it to my cousin for a proper clean, but I hit up the group chat with the information. Some musician stumbles into the shop with a twinkle in the eye and with his loan and interest in hand. I deal with that for like 10 minutes. Then I check the group chat again and see that there's been a bite on the offer. Apparently a friend of a friend is already on her way. I clarify that the phone won't be available until the following day, it's not clean yet. The group chat tells me I should have written back sooner. The buyer is already on her way. No way to cancel now. She has no phone. Before I have a chance to respond, this thoroughly caffeinated chick comes in. She's in a rush, she says. She needs the phone real quick. I tell her to come back tomorrow. She throws a fit. She doesn't have time, she says. Something something late gas payment. Something something can only pay with an app on the phone. Something something might get evicted if not paid by noon. The energy the woman brings into the store is the sort of shit that draws attention. She's making a scene. I cut her rant short. and I take out the phone and quote the price. She agrees. There's no thank you. Shop descends back into silence. The phone is no longer my problem and I've made a fourfold profit. I consider the situation resolved and carry on with my day. I don't think about the phone once until the following morning. Opening shift. I'm on my own. The moment I get behind the counter, the door opens and in walks this nightmarish parody of the human form. The guy is huge and weird and shaped like a watermelon. His skin is the shade of terminal gray and his eyes look like filthy marbles. Stretched out across his paunch is a filthy lab coat far too small for him. The man looks a complete lunatic. A merry morning to you. Has an iPhone of dubious ownership made its way into your emporium? In any circumstance, I would play dumb. I am good at playing dumb. But the moment the giant opened his mouth, I knew I was going to tell him exactly what he wanted to know. That shrill voice made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. The guy's teeth looked like sharpened crooked daggers. He had the constitution of a filthy sumo wrestler. I wasn't going to take my chances. I told him about the kid. The boy does not interest us. He has been taken back to class. <laughs> the overweight street scientist laughed as if he had said a joke. The guy's breath smelled like sulfur. I immediately found my finger sliding over the emergency robbery button. What interests us? Is whether the phone was sold to someone else? Yes, I choked out without the slightest hesitation. Good, the giant said. We are pleased. Then turning around on his heel like a rotating planet, he wobbled his way out of the shop. I'm still shaking. I'm hoping that whatever was wrong with that guy isn't contagious and I'm really hoping that I never have to see him again. A part of me wants to get in touch with the girl who bought the phone and warn her, but I don't want to get any deeper into this mess than I have to. Needless to say, if you have sticky fingers, be real careful about who you lift from. No idea where the kid is now, but I presume it's nowhere good. You'd do best to make sure you're not stealing from someone the size of a horse. Also, if you do manage to come into possession of some misappropriated goods, don't come to me. I'm sticking to a new no stolen shit policy. <laughs> my roommate, my oh-so-lovely roommate, had managed to avoid both the gas and electricity bill for a solid three months. Now we're on the edge of getting evicted. So just pay the bill, right? Nope. She's got no money on her account. So I'm going to cover the bill, and she'll get me back once her parents send her some cash. Now, not optimal, but... Not a disaster. Uh, what's that? You can only pay the bill through the company's smartphone app? Well, that's mighty inconvenient for someone who doesn't own a smartphone, isn't it? I tell her we need to pay the bill. She tells me it's not due until tomorrow afternoon. And she has a film and television society house party to get to. I tell her the bill was due three months ago, and 3 p.m. is just the deadline till we start the process of getting kicked out on the street. 
Tomato, tomato, she says. Paying won't take more than five minutes, she says. She'll be back by morning, she says. We'll sort it out then. Obviously, given my luck, she's not back by morning. Great. She's not back by noon. Even better. <laughs> so I start to accept the fact that she's not coming back anytime soon. So I sprint over to the cafe across the street and complain to the barista so my head doesn't explode. He doesn't offer up his phone, but he tells me his friend in the pawn shop up the street sells phones for very cheap. This information comes with a wink. I ask him how much. He tells me. I don't ask whether the phones are stolen. I don't need that kind of stress in my life. I go back home, and the roommate is still nowhere to be found. Not only are my chances of getting evicted becoming palpable, but there's also somewhere I gotta be in an hour. A lecture. A mandatory class that I didn't know was mandatory until last week. 1 p.m. I can't afford to miss it. Like, literally. I'm getting kicked out of uni unless I make this lecture. And after a solid five minutes of pacing, I sprint up the street to the pawn shop the barista mentioned. Not only is the place sketchy as all hell, but the guy behind the counter starts telling me he's not sure if he can sell me this discount phone. I lose my cool and start yelling. Kind of went blind with rage for a second. But when I came to, there's a phone in my hand and the guy behind the counter is asking me to leave. I figure my day just got considerably better. I figured wrong. Real wrong. First of all, there's a bazillion questions to answer when you're even setting up the phone. Secondly, the size of the application to actually pay the gas bill is massive. And finally, the most frustrating of all, I'm getting text messages. There's no SIM in the phone, but I'm getting text messages. I block the number, sprint to the cafe, and get the Wi-Fi password. The app still takes ages to download, and the barista keeps on trying to chat with me. But I manage to get the bill sorted out. The moment I get the confirmation email, I dash out the cafe and run towards the bus. I had a 30-minute commute in front of me, with just about 30 minutes to spare to get to the class. And that's when I first saw him. When I rushed by him, all I noticed was the horrid smell in his giant form. But even that was a passing thought in midst of a mad rush to make it to the bus. It wasn't until I collapsed in a seat that I could fully appreciate what I had run by. A fat mountain of a horribly unhealthy man draped in a lab coat. The guy looked straight at me, smiling, walking blindly through traffic towards the bus. I considered myself lucky when the doors closed and the unhinged-looking giant disappeared in the distance. I'm not a lucky person. I should have known then that something was wrong. Another string of texts. Same blocked number. I deleted the messages and blocked the number again. The possibility of the stranger in the dirty lab coat and the phone being connected didn't cross my mind in the least bit. I was way too focused on the bus clock ticking down towards my lecture. I was still making it on time, but my chest definitely felt like I was already 15 minutes late. Oh, no one can divide black. No one can. No one can escape the company. No one can escape the company of Professor again. I decided to take initiative and text back. Wrong number, I wrote. Before I had a chance to block the number again, the phone started to ring. Hi, you have the wrong number. Please don't call me again, I said, with as much strictness as I could muster. In response, I got an infinite sea of harsh static, 
Somewhere within that hush, though, there was a voice. Ugly and high-pitched and manic, he crawled into existence. No wrong number, no. This is the right number. Your friend is with us now. You will meet my assistant soon and he will bring you to me so that I can examine you. No one can escape the company of... I hung up the call and shut off the phone. The bill was paid. The phone didn't have to be turned on. In fact, I no longer needed a phone. Plan was to go back to the pawn shop as soon as my class was over and return the presumably stolen goods. I had absolutely zero interest in what the previous owner was up to or what the voice on the other side of the phone wanted. I had enough of my own problems to deal with. So I'm sitting there, just trying to keep my shit together watching the stations and bus clock like a hawk. Everything's going smooth. The driver seems to be audibly enjoying shutting the door in people's faces if they're running late. This sadist is going to ensure I don't get kicked out of uni, I figure. But then the bus stops. The numbers on the clock tick down and the bus keeps standing. I walk up to the driver trying to figure out why we aren't moving. There's an accident up ahead. Nothing particularly gnarly, just two cars that kissed on a busy road. I ask him if he can let me out. He couldn't be slower about getting the doors open. This guy actively enjoys me being late. So I get out on the road and I sprint. I'm literally a single station away from uni and there's the slimmest chances of me still making it on time. That slim thread of hope is severed about 30 seconds into the sprint, when I realize how out of shape I am. But I figure I can still make it at least five minutes late. I couldn't remember anything about the lecturer, but I really hope she wouldn't be cruel enough to fail me for coming in five minutes into the lecture. I made it into the university building, bathed in sweat, out of breath, and about six minutes late. I had to shove my way through a crowd of freshers to get down to the labs. The idiots were crowding the doors and chatting like they were back in grade school. It's while I was yelling at them that I noticed him. Outside, he was riding down towards the uni on one of those electric scooters people throw into rivers. The way that the little set of wheels kept them balanced regardless of his mammoth size was a marvel of physics. This guy stops the scooter with the unnerving grace of a ballerina and then calmly wobbles his way towards the university. Now, sure, the thought that the street scientist was stalking me did start to shimmer in the back of my mind. I definitely had a moment when I thought, yeah, this guy might be trouble. But whatever concern I had about the obese drifter in the lab coat was hushed under the realization that it was 107. Syllabus clearly said that anyone past 10 minutes late would be absent. Dealing with the weirdo would have to wait. I was not going to fail that class. I sprinted down the stairs towards the university's labs. The fact that the stairs were steep enough to dissuade the strange man's stubby legs calmed me down somewhat. The labs didn't. So, I know that the lecture is taking place in Lab C3. That's helpful. What isn't helpful is that all the corridors are nearly identical and that the names of the labs are printed in the tiniest of fonts. What makes the task of finding the lecture hall nearly impossible is that some of the labs are named after school contributors. I burst into three different labs before I find the right one. When I smash through the doors of Lab C3, the lecturer doesn't mention that I'm late. She just asks me whether I was at the Film and Television Society party last night as well. I say I wasn't. And then she says something, but I'm not listening. The rest of the seats are empty. I'm the only one who showed up. She says something about society parties ruining the work ethic of students and 
then says she'll wait five minutes before the lecture, just in case someone else decided to get out of bed today. I don't mind. I immediately make my way towards the sign-in sheet, jot down my signature, and collapse in the closest chair. Bill is paid. Expulsion avoided. I consider myself safe. But then the phone dings with a message. I immediately pull it out, mute it, and turn it off, but the loud chime does not go unnoticed. The lecturer glares at me as if I just puked in the middle of the royal wedding. She asks me if I did the reading for the class. I say I did. She asks me what I thought about it. I say I thought it was interesting. My phone chimes again. No one can, especially the company of Professor X. <laughs> My phone starts to ring again. The lecturer screams at me to leave. I don't argue. My name is on the sign-in sheet. And for all the registrar office will know, I attended the full class. I walk out into the hallway, pick up the call, and start to deal with the third looming problem of the day. I thought that maybe talking to this Professor Egghead would fix everything. So I pick up the call and calmly tell him that I bought the phone from a pawn shop and that I was going to return it. I give him the address of the shop and my assurances that the phone will be back at the store the next day. It's like I didn't say a word. The voice on the other end starts screeching again. Once you will accept the telecommunications device, you are part of the experiment. The guy is unhinged. He goes on about an assistant coming to retrieve me, and he's screaming about science, and it's, it's all too much. I hang up again. I hang up the phone. And it's in that moment that the connection hits me. The giant street scientist, the phone, they're connected. And just as the idea enters my mind, I gag. The smell hits me like a speeding bus, rotten eggs, and matches. Following that smell comes a deafening series of thuds. Down by the stairs, recovering from a horrible fall, sits a mass of flesh draped in a lab coat. Shit, I think. Why couldn't my roommate just pay the fucking gas bill on time? With a high-pitched sigh, the man climbs back up to his stubby feet. The fall down the stairs split this guy's head open, but he doesn't seem to give a shit. With blood running down his malformed face, he starts to wobble towards me. For a moment, I consider running back to the lecturer, but she's like 60 and wouldn't be of any help against a mentally unstable giant. There's only one way out. The stairs. Sure, there's a phosphorus-smelling obstacle in my way, but I figure I can squeeze past him. I figure wrong. Running towards the giant, I feel no fear. Fortified by the head injury, his gaze is completely vacant. His eyes are void of reflex. It looks like he's sleepwalking, or more accurately, sleep rolling on the floor. Yet the moment I pass him, his stubby fingers launch like a filthy panther. He grabs me far too tight by my arm and lifts me up in the air. There's still zero expression in his eyes, but when I'm up in the air, kicking and screaming for help, the giant's mouth opens into a wide, sharp-toothed smile. His grip tightens and a lightning bolt of pain travels up towards my chest. It's not just pain, though. Somewhere beneath the burning ache, there's something else. I'm raised up in the air, kicking my feet, but somehow that feeling of weightlessness gets stronger with each second. My mind goes faint. The world starts to hiss away through a tidal wave of static. No one escapes the company of Professor Egghead. Past the sharp gray fog, I see a silhouette. I see a, a silhouette of an egg. You are now a part of the control group. When humanity withers, 
You are beneath the crushing force of incomprehensible science. Professor Egghead will keep you safe. No one escapes the company of- The hallway floor meets me like an angry bouncer. Above me, the filthy giant holds out his hand in midair, confused. Below him, with my limbs lubricated with sweat, I sit free of his embrace. The moment I realize I'm free, I kick the guy as hard as I can, climb to my knees and sprint up the stairs like my life depends on it. That wave of static comes crashing back. I barely reach the top of the stairs before I have to hold myself up against the railing. My sweaty palms nearly slip me down the stairs, but once I catch my breath, my vision calms. Down below, the sickly giant glares at the stairs that are far too steep for him. And for a moment, I feel safe. But then the guy throws himself onto the stairway like he's doing a trust fall. The thud of his head hitting the stairs sounds like a death knoll. But in an instant, the mass of flesh pulls itself up to its stubby limbs and starts crawling up towards me. It's like 1.15, and classes are in session. There's no one around. Beyond the glass doors of the university, there's a scooter that I can't outrun. Hoping to find more people, I dash into the library. The phone rings again. Muscle memory takes over and I shut that horrid sound off almost immediately. But I stop before I put the phone back in my pocket. Once you will accept the telecommunication device, you are part of the experiment. I slide the phone across one of the study desks with no regard for where it goes. Then I beeline it towards the one beanbag where I sometimes take naps between classes. It's a good hiding spot. To make it an even better hiding spot, I crawl beneath the beanbag. It's stuffy, and my heart is racing and I'm barely holding my shit together, but past my hyperventilating, I can hear two freshers. Is this yours? No, I thought it was yours. I lift up the beanbag to let in some fresh air. The library smells of phosphorus. Hey, dude, what are you doing? No one's looking. Got a friend who buys these things. Beneath their voices, I hear a high-pitched moan. What if someone calls it? Soph, calm down, man. Heavy feet waddle down the library carpet. Dude, stealing's like really lame. Shh. Dead hush is back. I start feeling lightheaded again. Somewhere within that static, I see the outline of an egg. Good job, dude. Everyone's looking at us. Can't even put the phone on the table without being obvious. Whatever. It's a multiple choice quiz anyway. Screw studying. Gonna head home. Everything fades beneath the rush of blood to my ears. I climb out from beneath the beanbag, gasping for air, but I am blind. There is no library. There is only static. And within that static is a silhouette of an egg. Professor Egghead screams through my soul. No one can escape the company of Professor Egghead. The number is always correct. I have dialed a thousand phones throughout my scientific career, and I have never had a phone call that could be described as less than excellent. I am Professor Egghead. And I would never make a mistake on the phone, or anywhere else in this mortal realm for that matter. I am Professor Egghead, and no one can escape the company of... A breath of fresh air. I'm still sprawled out on the library floor, but I can feel my limbs. I hide back under the beanbag for a solid minute or two, making sure that weird giant isn't hiding somewhere behind a bookshelf. But as my heart rate slows down, I climb up to my feet and look around. The study desk is empty. The phone is gone. 
The phone is gone and so is the giant. I let out a sigh of relief at having solved my third major problem of the day. That feeling of accomplishment doesn't last long, though. Outside, riding up the hill on his bike, I see the kid from the study desk. Behind him, defying the laws of balance with his lab coat fluttering in the wind, rise the sickly giant. I feel bad for the kid, but not for long. I'm just happy the gas bill got paid and I didn't get expelled. Five years ago, my twin brother moved overseas to see the world. Him being on a different continent than me didn't make it easy to stay in touch, and after about a year of regular Skype calls, well, we drifted apart. To try to keep tabs on the guy, I followed a neighbourhood Facebook group from the city where he ended up living. I had to use Google Translate to figure out what the posts were about, but... It was a nice way of getting to guess how his days were going. Ah, it's heavy rainfall season. Hope Simon has an umbrella. Wow, that looks like a fun festival. Hope Simon can check it out. Australian national arrested. Kidnapping. Missing person. Torture. That's how I found out that my brother had been arrested. Through a Google translated post nestled in between someone selling a bathtub and a missing dog plea. We're nearly identical twins, and yet, the picture that accompanied the announcement looked nothing like me. Simon had gained an unearthly amount of weight, and he seemed to have grown considerably taller. His face had looked sickly and sleepless, and his neck had disappeared under rolls of discomfortingly pale skin. His arms and legs retracted back into his massive body and looked like stunned baby limbs. The giant wearing cuffs in a baby blue prison uniform looked like some distant, nightmarish echo of Simon, but the name read clear. It was him. After a couple of phone calls with the embassy, I got complete confirmation. My twin brother was accused of doing some terrible things far away from home. Someone needed to go be with him, so I went. I won't go into the details of his crimes. They are obscene and I don't want to ever have to go over them again. To put it shortly, he did it. Before I got to see him, I had some doubts. I couldn't imagine Simon hurting anyone. I couldn't imagine my brother being fundamentally broken. Yet the moment I visited that prison, I knew. I knew that my brother was gone and replaced by a horrid, neckless giant. I got a copy of the key from Simon's landlord, but I slept in a hostel for the first few nights. The studio apartment that my brother had been living in stank of rot and grease, and it was filled with hundreds of thick, college textbooks. What little space wasn't occupied by tomes of biology and quantum physics was covered in plastic wrappers and what looked like crushed up eggshell. Finding some place to donate the textbooks and scrubbing out all the grime out of the apartment it was exhausting, but it kept me from thinking too much about my brother. The first night that I slept in his old apartment, however, the thoughts became unavoidable. I couldn't help but wonder what it was like for Simon to live in those horrible, cramped conditions. I wondered whether I could have helped him somehow. Out here, foreigners pay their rent in yearly installments. With an additional fee, Simon's old landlord said I could live in the apartment for the next couple of weeks. I stayed in town. The mystery of my brother's transformation kept me around. For weeks, I crawled through every expat-friendly bar trying to find someone who knew Simon. No one knew him, but they all talked about him. The trial was on every television I passed. From the cryptic Google translated articles, I found out that he got life in prison. No leads presented themselves. 
Simon's old landlord started asking for additional fees, and I figured it was time for me to go home. In the middle of researching flights, however, the internet cut out. Minor internet outage isn't something rare for the city Simon moved out to, so I decided to take a bit of a break from the computer. Instead of finding something to eat or going bar diving in the expat streets, I sat down on Simon's couch and messed around with his television. I couldn't understand any of the local channels, and my phone started to ding with notifications again. But just as I was getting ready to go back to the computer, I noticed Simon's DVD player. Judging by the state of the apartment, the DVD player was something that hadn't moved from under the television for a couple of decades. But out of curiosity, on the off chance that Simon got sentimental for old tech, I opened it. Professor Egghead's Healthy Transformation Diet A store-bought, blank DVD, with the title written on it in green sharpie just like the kind bootleggers on the old street sold. Seized with a sudden curiosity with what Simon could have watched before he turned into a dead-eyed monster, I pushed the DVD back into the machine and I pressed play. An old gym flickered onto the screen. The windows were covered in dust. The workout machines screamed in horrid rust-filled agony. Yet the clientele of the gym, they were dressed in bright neon spandex. They were all furiously working out, and there was no music. Everyone just looked uncomfortable. The scene crawled on for long enough to where I almost turned off the television, but suddenly, from beneath the pained grinding of the workout equipment, I could hear a growing wave of applause. The show had a studio audience, and the audience was getting hyped. This excitement did not cross over to the actors. They were aware of the applause, The moment the clapping started, they all went completely still. The discomfort of the actors blossomed into fear. The weightlifters pulled on the equipment as if they were trying to rip it apart. The people doing yoga stretched their bodies into discomforting shapes. With each moment that the applause grew, their pantomime of exercise gained in terrified fury. Finally, the door of the gym flew open. To the highest degree! The egg shaped abomination screamed as he wobbled into the room. The muscle that you are trying to rip apart and rebuild are useless! You are wasting both your time and mine! Stop exercising this instant! He had the face of a man, but that is where any human connection ceased. The rest of the creature's body was shaped like an egg, small. Baby-like limbs stemmed from the egg, and a filthy lab coat with suspenders masked the Eggman's nakedness. The audience screamed in joy, as if a beloved figure had appeared. The Egghead showed no care for their praise. He simply continued marching towards the clientele of the gym. Hey, bro. Stuttered one of the weightlifters. There's no judgement in this gym. This is a positive space. Immediately, the muscle-bound man averted his eyes from the monstrosity. I am not your brother! The creature screamed to joyous laughter from the audience. I am Professor Egghead, the leading expert on science, the apex predator of the world's laboratory! The gym shook with another standing ovation. The Egghead drank in the applause. He smacked his lips, as if he was being fed a treat. But the moment he raised his arms... The audience went quiet. These days, all you simpletons get your information from a man who talks about chimpanzees! The egghead screamed at the terrified clientele of the gym. You are all ignorant! You have all gone dumb from a lack of peer-reviewed academia in your lives! It all ends now! All your useless stretching and pulling of weights ends now! I will educate you in the true form of exercise. Please, Mr. Egghead, said one of the spandex-clad women, stretching on the moldy foam mats. Can we just do our yoga in peace? Mister, did you just call me Mister? The Egghead 
punctuated his words with a furious, dull stomp. A yellowing foam started to gather at the edge of his sickly lips. Mr. Egghead was my father! I did not spend 17 years cleaning sweat from the walls of universities all across the globe to be addressed as a commoner! I am a professor! I shall be addressed as such! The woman's lips moved, but no words came out. She looked like she was trying to apologize, but the egg-shaped nightmare was blind to her remorse. With one swift motion, he ripped the yoga mat from beneath her body. After a discomforting spin in the air, she landed on the hard floor of the gym. With his stubby fingers moving much faster than they should, Professor Egghead rolled up the yoga mat into a foam club and started beating the woman on the floor. Flexibility will not save you from the boot heels of history. When society crumbles, your yoga will be useless. After a couple of impotent hits from his foam club, Professor Egghead moved over to one of the weightlifters. The mat was soft, but its blows landed with high-pitched slaps. Even though the weightlifter was thrice the size of the egghead, he cowered in fear at the oddly shaped scientist's blows. No amount of muscle tissue in your arms will hold you up when the incomprehensible comes to roost. No legs are fast enough to outrun the death march of progress. Your core will be utterly useless when faced with the inevitable assimilation that awaits humanity. No! You need to only exercise one muscle. The egghead pressed the foam mat against the bodybuilder's sweaty forehead. He tapped it with a gentle, almost erotic touch of the yoga mat. Your brain is the body's smartest muscle. It is the only thing in the universe that is capable of observing itself and rationalizing its surroundings. You must work on it every night and day. You must make it a muscle, as the laws of physics will allow. The audience went wild for the egghead's monologue, but the professor did not acknowledge them this time. He kept his exhausted eyes locked on the weightlifter. The foam that had gathered at the edge of the professor's lips was now dripping down in thick, yolky chunks. The nightmare was silent, but he was more than ready to jump into another diatribe. How do I exercise my b b brain, b b Professor Egghead? The bodybuilder wheezed, like a dog that's being scratched behind the ear. Professor Egghead's eyes closed at the mention of his own name. I am happy you asked. He sang. Knowing how to exercise your most important muscle is more important than hygiene or drinking water combined. Simply think of your favorite equation and close your eyes. Everyone in the gym immediately shut their eyes. The professor inspected each of the gym's clientele before looking directly at the audience. I shifted on the couch. I knew it was just a trick of the camera, but I was certain that the nightmare creature on the screen was aware of my existence. You at home! Audience, it is time for you to close your eyes and think of your favorite equation as well. It can be any equation you desire. As long as it's scientific, it is good for you. My favorite vintage is the Langerian. Langerian equals one half mv squared minus mgz. M is mass, v is velocity, and Z is height. Do you have your equation ready, audience? Good. Now exercise that muscle. With his eyes closed, the egghead looked strangely peaceful, like a terminally ill baby that had fallen asleep for the final time. For a solid two minutes, the gym was completely silent. All that could be heard was the dripping of spittle from the egghead's filthy mouth. I hope no one at home cheated. All those who tried to swindle the egghead will be remembered during the final experiment. The egghead screamed, ripping me from my thoughts. Now that you know how to exercise your mind, this gym should be ripped apart. 
and transformed into a library. Forget the weights and forget the yoga mats. All you need to remember are the equations. Paired with a healthy diet, this exercise will allow you to prepare for the horrid path down which humanity walks. The studio audience roared with applause, and the egghead once again indulged in their attention. As if each clap was a jolt of electricity that gave him strength, Professor Egghead started dancing in the center of the room. The gym clientele backed away from the exercise equipment. The little nightmare had convinced them. Professor Egghead? The lady which had been thrown to the floor asked, What does a healthy diet consist of? Like an ill-shaped ballerina, the egghead turned around at his heel and faced the woman. With a grin of sharp, needle-like teeth, the professor slurped in all of the sickly mucus around his lips. Happy you asked, the professor said, grinning a sharp, crooked smile. Professor Egghead is very happy you asked this specific question. The scene cut. What I saw next will forever be seared into my brain. A naked, filthy man crawled through a demented world. The land beneath his feet at first seemed like a hill of pale, white pebbles. But as the desperate man crawled up the mountain, he took handfuls of the rocks and chewed them in his grizzled mouth. Every bite he took sent greenish clumps of yolk dripping down his chin. Out beyond him, an infinite desert of eggs lay. Each dune he passed led to an even bigger one. Each step he took echoed with the cracking of life. Yet the eggs beneath his feet were plentiful. A true healthy diet only consists of one thing! The nightmarish professor screamed, standing gargantuan on the horizon, blocking out the sky. Egg! Egg is the only thing that you must eat! Egg is the only thing that will make you strong! Egg is life! Egg is love! Egg is science! Like a wild animal that has been starved in a cage, the man ate the eggs. His beard was filled with eggshell and yolk, yet he showed no signs of slowing down. He scoffed the eggs down, like a wild animal. He looked scarcely like a man, yet his face, it seemed familiar. Simon. You must eat the egg and keep your brain strong. You must eat the egg because soon I will call upon you to act in my stead. Soon you shall hear my voice and you shall help me preserve humanity. You must eat the egg so that- I turned off the television. My heart was deep in my throat and I felt nauseous. Even though the screen had turned blank, the image remained. My flesh and blood. My brother, my twin, Simon, crawling through the sea of eggs, grizzled and mad. It was far too much for me. I got off the couch and paced around, trying to catch my breath. I splashed water on my face from the kitchen sink and then drank some of it. And then I went to the fridge, opened it up and grabbed an egg out of the carton. The movement was purely mechanical. There was no thought behind it. All I knew was that an egg would make me feel better. My hands came to a shivering stop, inches away from my mouth. The rational side of me knew that biting down on that egg was a wholly insane thing to do, but somewhere inside of me, a falsetto screamed otherwise. My resistance towards the maddening pull of the egg did not last long. The eggshell stuck to my tongue, and its yolky contents made me heave, but I swallowed every last bit of that egg. I crushed up the egg in my mouth and swallowed it, and then I reached for another one, and another one, and another one. When the carton in the fridge was empty, I forced myself to the couch. I forced myself to breathe and wait and rationalize. But again, that falsetto voice wouldn't let me. 
It dragged me from the couch, to the door, and then out to the street. I returned with eggs. A lot of eggs. Life had been hell since the moment I touched that DVD player. Against my own better judgement, I have re-watched the Professor Egghead DVD repeatedly. I kept on telling myself I was looking for some detail on the footage, some hint as to how I could rid myself of this curse, but I know that in truth, I was looking for something much simpler. I was looking for something to watch while I ate. Somewhere on the other side of the country, my twin brother sits in a cramped jail cell awaiting a makeshift knife from someone who heard about his crimes. Last time I saw Simon, he looked nothing like me, but now, when I look into the mirror, I see we have become similar once more. I cannot stop. The falsetto screams deep in my heart will not let me. Even as I write this, my mouth is filled with eggshell and raw yolk. I cannot resist the voice, and its demands are growing more numerous. It doesn't want me to eat eggs anymore. No, it wants me to go out and do the bidding of the professor. It wants me to go out and act in the name of science. I cannot resist the voice, and I fear that soon enough I will see Simon again. I crawl out of the bushes to a sun drenched in red. The songs and laughter of my friends are long gone. All that I am left with is the squealing of children from a nearby playground and the stomps and wheezes of exhausted joggers. I am surrounded by trees and grass and lakes. Yet on the horizon, concrete towers swallow up the setting sun. I am in the middle of Prague 13 Central Park and there's a pressure cooker frothing in the back of my skull. Hundreds of millions of years ago, this land was flooded with volcanic activity. The earth shifted, both on its own and through the hand of man. The land was cleared to make room for grazing and farmland, and eventually the ever-sprawling monster of the mother of all cities consumed it. All around me stand Soviet-era housing blocks, no older than half a century, but in the center of the park. Nestled right between two man-made lakes, sits an echo of the planet's primal past. The hill bears little resemblance to the mighty volcano it once was. It would scarcely be described as a particularly large hill, yet in its core the world-creating power still simmers. I hear the hill whispering to me. Shaking my head does nothing to calm those whispers. There is a path to take up the old volcano, but out of instinct I ignore it. Like a mountain goat rushing to a destination he cannot comprehend, I clamber my way up directly through the incline of the hill. Past the crunch of old rock beneath my feet, I hear a symphony of voices. The language which they speak is completely foreign to me, but I understand exactly what the shivers in my chest are trying to tell me. I wipe the tears from my eyes and continue my climb. No matter how much I shake my head, the voices keep on getting louder and louder. Don't be scared, my child. We mean you no harm. The ancient rock beneath my feet slips away until I am on top of the hill. Somewhere beyond the trees, my friends are sitting and laughing and having a good time. I reach for my phone to call them, but I cannot make sense of the scream. Somewhere, a thousand miles away, men dug into the earth and forced out minerals to create the machine in my hand. The sweat that rolled down their backs as they pried the metal from the stone swells down my back. Without my consent, the phone drops into the primal dust of the hill. Beyond me, the arteries of Prague lie revealed. The only unearthed section of the city's metro shudders as a hundred souls rocket through it. Does our voice not bring you joy? The grinding metal of the subway asks. Why do you refuse our call? The overpass rumbles. Tears well up in my eyes and my knees grow weak. I am not in pain. Each syllable of the voice encompasses me fully and drives tendrils of ecstasy through my being. Yet that joy is diluted. That joy is diluted in gut-wrenching fear. 
You are our progeny, our gift, our offering to the altar of life. You are a part of the whole, and it pains us to see you reject it. I fall to my knees and raise a cloud of pale red dust. The sky is the color of a burning bush. I realize I can no longer ignore it. God, I whisper to the heavens, is that you? Yes. The particles of eternity floating around me say, It is we, the harbinger of creation, the summation of perception, the whole. It is we, God. I cannot help but grip the earth in my hands. Sharp bits of crushed stone lacerate the flesh beneath my fingernails, but I do not feel pain. I struggle to breathe past the joy burning in my throat. What? I gulp for air like a man drowning. What do you want from me? You are a part of the whole, child. You are an appendage of the whole. You are loved by the whole. Each word bounces off infinitely into the universe. The prehistoric rock beneath me, the burning ball of fire on the horizon, the cement of the brutalist buildings, they all speak to me in a singular voice. You are a part of the whole. You are a part of us. You and us are one, and we need your aid. The spotlight of the universe is aimed straight at me. I feel each and every life burn through my veins. What? I bark in ecstasy. What do you want me to do, God? Another train shoots through the overpass. It breaks ever so slightly as it re-enters the earth. The machine is far away from me and is obstructed through sheets of metal and glass, yet I can feel the sparks of the grinding metal. The world is in danger. They sizzle. The world is in danger and it needs your help. Beyond the gray cement of the panel housing, a magnificent beam of light rises. The universe points to where it wants me to go. We are the creator and the creation. We are the alpha and the omega. We are the force which keeps the universe alive. Yet in the dark corners of this world our power wanes. It is necessary for these corners of darkness to see the light. With each glimmer of sunlight that fades from the sky, the beam of light grows stronger. In the brief interim that the voice does not speak, I pick up my phone and climb to my feet. I try to call my friends, but the symbols on the screen look like ancient hieroglyphs. We need you to walk to the place which our light cannot reach. The beam of light pulses in the darkening sky. We need you to go there and set the darkness aflame. My legs move without consent and drag me toward the edge of the hill. It's as if the earth itself is moving beneath my feet, and I have been singled out from the inertia of its rotation. The voice still speaks to me, but it communicates through soft whispers which do not challenge my constitution. As I crawl my way down the ancient hill, the voice soothes me. It tells me I am doing the right thing. It tells me I am being good. Past the pleasure of the universe's company, I stop to question my destination. The greenery of the park falls away and I am led up a cement road. Beyond a lawn of sun-dried grass sits a white monolith of a building. The word Tesco burns in blue and red into the quickly approaching night. For there still, an even brighter light shines. The heavens order me to move and I do not resist. To whispers drenched in cosmic unity, I stumble my way towards the burning beacon. On the crosswalk, I am nearly hit by a bus. The driver leans out of the window and screams obscenities at me. The man's baby blue shirt is drenched in sweat, and furious spit follows his words. But beneath the rage, I can hear another voice. Do not fear him, child. The bus rumbles. Do not fear anything. You walk with us. You walk with God. The beam of light leads me down towards the Lucas subway. Nestled between an office supply store and a corner shop, it stands, a dusty storefront. Not far from it, a man who could be a vagrant or an artist strums on his guitar. He plays the strings quietly, as if only for himself, yet they echo in my skull like a symphony. This is the place. The metal strings sing. This is the place in which we are powerless. This is the place which must burn. 
Without conscious effort, I press my palms against the glass door of the dusty store and push. The voice has infused my chest with the same undeniable joy that it always carried, yet the moment I cross the threshold of the store, I am alone. The ecstasy flows out of my lungs and I am caught in what almost feels like a post-coital glow. That dull pleasure soon recedes under fear of the unknown. The air is filled with cigarette smoke and the smell of plastic. Lamplight scarcely reaches the dusty windows, but clumps of televisions hang from the ceiling like discount chandeliers. They all play the same show. Beneath the dim light of a washed-out Simpsons episode, I see a VHS rental. Behind the counter sits a teenage boy with terminally sick skin and angry eyes. In his skeletal fingers, he holds a cigarette. When he ashes it, he doesn't look at the ashtray. He only looks at me. I check my phone. The numbers on the screen are legible even past my exhausted eyes. There's two missed calls and a handful of text messages waiting for me. My friends are worried about where I disappeared to. I pick open the group chat and attempt to make sense of my situation. I have heard the voice of God. It wants me to burn down a VHS rental place. I stare at a message for a moment checking for syntax and then I delete it. I try to phrase my explanation in a way that doesn't make me sound completely unhinged. Before I compose another reply, however, a croaky voice calls to me from the counter. Can I help you, sir? He pronounces sir with the intonation of a slur. Everything on his face indicates that help is precisely not the thing he wants to provide. Just looking around, I mumble. To illustrate my innocence, I put away my phone and walk through the shelves of VHS tapes. Everything I come across is Hollywood, but the titles have been translated into the Slavic tongue. Lethal trap, coconuts on the snow, death awaits everywhere. Beneath the boxes advertising the movies, there are metal nails with tokens indicating availability. From the looks of it, most of the movies have been checked out. Hey. The frail teen screams from across the room. Sir. I turn around to face him. He stubs out his cigarette as if he were trying to smother a bug. You're looking for a recommendation, sir? Sure, I say, trying to make sense of my position in the universe. The teen cocks his head to the side. Next to the counter there is a shabby red curtain leading to an adults-only area. On the mosaic of televisions, Homer Simpson chokes his son for comedic effect. Back when I was a kid, my uncle used to bring me over to a rental place not far from his apartment. Each visit, I would rent out 1996's Space Jam and watch it over and over until the next visit when I would rent it out again. When I was a child, I lived in an ever-expanding universe of Michael Jordan fighting vague space monsters. I was enthralled by the movie, but with each visit, as I grew older, I became curious about what was happening behind the red curtain section where only the adults were allowed. Then my uncle got cable, and I never visited a rental place again. Standing in the dim light of Simpson reruns, I decide to explore that which made me curious as a youth and get away from the strange teen in the same stride. As I push aside the heavy curtain, the gray-skinned attendant grins at me. His eyes don't lose their rage. Hope you find what you like, sir. The curtain falls behind my back and traps me in a small, musty room. There are rows of sheathed cassettes, but I cannot make out their titles. Among the tapes, scattered through the shelves with little logic, there are bulky televisions of the 90s. They all lay dormant. For a moment, I consider what brought me to this place. All memories of walking to the rental seem a thousand miles away. For a moment, I consider whether my trip up the hill could have been an elaborate hallucination, but before that thought can bear fruit, the televisions hiss to life. I am bathed in the light of the screens, and I lose all doubt about the nature of where I am. I am in a place where God holds no dominion. I am in a place of true evil. On the screens a creature appears, an inhuman creature of an oval shape that is masquerading as a man. It screams from the bottom of its misshapen lungs and darts around the television like a feral animal. It screams about knowledge and science and death. 
I keep on trying to remind myself that the beast is just the product of a twisted imagination, that it is not real, yet I feel it watching me through the screens. The egg-shaped being howls in barely comprehensible speech and stares straight into my soul. Sir, where are you going, sir? Asks the sickly youth as I stumble from behind the curtain. You're not done here, sir. Come back. The moment I breathe in the night air, I nearly get hit by a bus again. The downtrodden man with the guitar is gone, as is the voice of God. I'm left alone with nothing but the echoes of the furious creature's screams to keep me company. My friends loiter around the fast food kiosk in the subway feasting on reheated pizza and water. I try to explain to them where the past two hours of my life went, but my sentences stretch out into the ether and scarcely connect into meaning. My friends are also far too occupied with their food. Through famished bites, they ask me if I want a slice. I decline. After the feast is finished, the group starts drifting off to its various sources of public transportation to retreat back home. Martin asks me if I want a cigarette. Apparently, I look shaken. I, again, decline. My lungs are in no position to receive tar. My subway ride is far from pleasant. Opposite me sways a man in a dirty construction vest. He has drank himself to the edge of unconsciousness, yet he still sips on a crushed up can of Cherny Cozel. Next to me sits a boy of maybe 15 who desperately needs a shower. He stares down into his phone and taps away at a coin filled game, willfully unaware of his odor. I press my head against the plexiglass window and watch the steadily repeating sea of dark wires. The voice of God is nowhere to be found. I almost accept that it was all a hallucination, that my entire evening had no greater meaning to the universe, but then a change of scenery wipes those doubts away. The darkness of the subway tunnel is replaced with the darkness of night. As the subway rushes between the Hurka and Lugini station, a slice of the outside world is revealed. Beyond the plexiglass, Central Park is plunged into a primal darkness. Off in the distance, the windows of panel houses shine, and there are impotent little lamps dotting the jogging paths, but they are but small vestiges in a sea of black. In the center of the park, stealing away the sky from the moon, the once mighty Vulcan rests like a giant mid-slumber. The place in which we are powerless must be destroyed. The hill whispers straight to my heart. Please, child, the universe begs of you. Carry out our will. Carry out the will of the whole. The joyous rush of the voice makes my legs twitch hard enough to kick the kid sitting next to me. The foul-smelling youth stares at me in horror through his greasy locks and retreats to the other side of the carriage. The drunk with the reflective jacket simply gives me a knowing smile. What do you want me to do, God? I mumble past clenched teeth. The place which you have witnessed. The hill hums as it disappears from view. The place must burn. Sir? A badge not suited for prolonged inspection is shoved in my face. The man who holds it is strong and impatient. If he weren't wearing the colors of the ticket checkers, I would have mistook his request for a mugging. My hands shake as I produce my transport card for scanning. That night, and for three nights after, I dream of the VHS rental. Sir. I find myself back in that dimly lit room with the gray-skinned teen staring at me with horrid yellowed eyes. The televisions around us buzz, and the air is filled with the smell of plastic and stale tobacco. The dream always feels real. It always feels undeniable. Where are you going, sir? The teen grips the counter as he speaks, and his nails shed cheap paint with every word. I cannot see his feet, but I can hear them. He stomps like a madman, trying to contain in him the urge to strangle. With each kick, the youth's body grows, as if being inflated by an invisible bicycle pump. His skin is far too weak to handle the strain of the growing body. It starts to break. In a baptism of blood, the boy's body shifts even further. Soon enough, I am face to face with an oval-shaped hunk of flesh. We're not done here, sir. Soon enough, I am facing the horror I met behind the red curtain. 
He screams in a horrid falsetto, terrible diatribe scarcely connected to reality. He rambles about science and inventions and knowledge and experiments and equations. I try to turn away, but the eldritch being of blood and skin won't let me be. It says no one can deny its company. It says we're not done here. For two days I shake my head and deny my nights. I try to excuse my visions through stress and lack of sleep and psychosis. Yet no matter how much I try to get the echoes of the screams out of my memory, they always return come sundown. My longing for peace and guidance drives me towards extremes. On the third day I research. On the fourth day I prepare. On the fifth night I board a subway heading towards Prague 13. Hundreds of millions years later, nestled in the center of a man-made park, the hill still stands defiant. Burning in the darkness, there are lamplights and windows and cars, but they seem like nothing but fireflies temporarily resting on an internal landscape. Some of those fireflies blink blue and red. The air smells of burning plastic and accelerants. You have done well, child. The ancient rock beneath me whispers. There is still evil in this world, but you have done enough service. Stacks of pitch black smoke bleed out into the moonlight sky from behind the panel housing. I strip off my drenched shirt and shake the broken glass out of my hair. The voice of God continues to shiver through my being. It keeps on telling me I did the right thing. It tells me to be happy. With each word it grows fainter. It tells me to be happy, but with each word it slowly abandons me. When God finally disappears, I am left with a single thought. A single prayer, a desperate hope that I will never see the egg-shaped monstrosity in my dreams ever again.